to welcome everybody to our uh, Board of Supervisors budget session for February 26, 2019. Um, we have quite a few um, subjects to go through today and we'll start our day as usual with an invocation uh, by Ms. Las Colette and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mr. Peterson. So please rise. Almighty God, before we consider a resolution, pass an ordinance, or make an appointment, we first want to take the time to say thank you. We realize that without you, the business of this great county could not be conducted. Now grant us the courage, wisdom, and foresight to provide for the needs of all of our people to fulfill our obligations in this community. Help us to further realize the purpose and plan for the county of Goochland. We ask that you continue to keep us in your perfect peace. And it is in your sovereign name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, the chair's comments, and I don't have anything to add today, so I'm going to cede my three minutes <laughs> <laughs> to uh, Mr. Budeski for some comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just before we go into citizens' comment, I did want to welcome everybody here today. Um, we have a number of folks with us here from a diverse array of departments. Uh, but one individual you don't see with us here today is Miss Horlacher. Uh, she is home where she needs to be, taking care of a, a family matter. Um, we wish her uh, and her family the best and all that. Uh, Kathleen's here with us today, and, and I will be assisting her uh, amongst all of our other professionals in the room to best address uh, the questions the board may have as we go through the presentations today. But uh, welcome everybody here today and, and look forward to uh, sharing with the board uh, the proposed budget recommendations as it relates uh, to revenues, debt and policies, general governance administration, which covers a number of departments, our judicial administration departments, utilities, and the Tucko Creek Service District. And we will wrap up today with the community development divisions uh, and the overall department. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Budeski. So at this point, I will go ahead and open the uh, citizen comment period. Anyone wishing to speak on any topic of importance to Goochland County? We also know this period as Mr. Lyle's uh, speaking moment. <laughs> um, now I'm just going to have to stand here for a second and collect my thoughts, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, I am Jonathan Lyle, uh, 1521 Mannequin Road, and I am uh, just giving you a brief update, uh, Monica Soil and Water Conservation District, in that uh, the budget that was passed by the General Assembly did provide us level funding uh, throughout all of the districts. There are 47, as you know, and so we don't get all of the money that in the budget, but um, we have been planning within our budget for level funding. Um, and I appreciate very much the process you folks go through as uh, board members and, and uh, I appreciate that in my hierarchy, public safety, transportation, education are the big three, and everything everything else after that is a nice to have. But those three, for me personally as a taxpayer, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the board now, I'm speaking as behalf of Jonathan Lau, citizen, uh, is where I like to see the priorities made. That having been said, I firmly believe that Monica does contribute to the overall well-being of the county is you make your tough decisions, there needs to be more put to those big three, as I might call them. I understand. 
if you start to think feral cats need more money instead of us, I might have an issue with you. But uh, by and large, I appreciate the process you're going through. We have uh, provided your staff uh, with as much information as, as requested. Um, if you have questions, we have adult supervision for me here today, Mr. Uh, Burgess, our district uh, uh, manager is here, so I'll uh, just leave it at that. But thank you for what you're doing. We receive level funding from the state. Uh, we do operate to the best interest, as we believe, for the county. And uh, if you have questions, I'm sure either Mr. Burgess or Ms. Bird can answer those. So thank you very much. Light didn't go off. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Lyle. Anyone else wishes to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public uh, citizen comment period. So, Mr. Budeski, the first item on the agenda is revenues. Ms. Smith. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Budeski, and Board of Directors. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Try that again. I'm <laughs> Kathleen Smith, the Assistant Director for Financial Services, and I'm going to be presenting the revenues, debt, and policies, general government administration, and the judicial administration. Okay. General fund revenues. This is the um, this is a review of the major revenues that the county has. Real property remains the major source of the county's revenue at 46%. Um, second is other property taxes, which is 23, per, or personal property taxes at 23%. And then we have other local taxes. Last year was level with state and federal. This year it's up a percent at 12. And that is made up mainly of sales tax, business licenses, and bank stock taxes. This is the total taxable assessed values of our real estate. And again, we, as we know, real estate is the largest source of our revenue. And as you can see, it's on a steady incline upwards. Kathleen, before you leave that point, one of the requests that we're working on that the board had made uh, last time was to make sure that we looked at our our taxable revenue base and we looked at our expenditures with cost of living impacts. Mm -hmm. um, we are working on that chart. Just want to make sure that, uh, you should have that at your next meeting, I hope. Um, but we, we promised the board that we'd provide them that so we can understand uh, even at the where you see the 19 level, um, we, we're really just starting to pass where we back, were back in, in, in seven, eight time frame. So this chart starts when the decline really began. We're just getting back to uh, levels above where we were back in uh, six, seven, eight. This is showing us our new construction assessed values. Um, calendar year 2018, we saw a large increase in both TCSD and county new construction. Real estate tax revenues, um, they can, are continuing an upward trend with a 5.1% increase over the uh, fiscal year 19 budget. Personal property taxes. These include the local and state portions. The state is remaining flat. The local varies. It's on an upward trend, but a slow one. Um, and the 2013 fluctuation, that was due to the one-time hit for going to twice a year payments. Local sales tax revenues. Um, like the personal uh, property tax sales, the taxes are fluctuating but are on an upward trend. Business license revenues. Actual business revenue is remaining. Okay, on the two actuals, FY17 and 18, they're basically flat. We've got a projection in a couple of slides that shows 2019 coming in flat for those two years as well. Building permit revenues, they fluctuate, but is basically remaining flat. You get a lot of ups and downs with the fluctuations in building, and weather also would have a problem with that as well. 
and then we get to our revenue projections and that's where you can see the business licenses at 910 everything else is um, as we presented everywhere else do we have any questions questions for Ms. Smith so far Just to, just you're, you're about to, uh, we will have talked about the expenditure side throughout this mm -hmm. conversation. These are our, our revenue projections. Remember, when we, when we budget, um, we're, some years our actuals are higher than what you'll actually see in the budget for projections. Uh, we don't go at the peaks on trends, and so we're, we're always somewhat conservative, even though an actual may have come in, you know, even several hundreds of thousands of dollars. We don't we don't budget our projections off of those peaks. We do try to look at trends, and so even even when you have actual numbers from last year, um, we're not always doing our projections off that peak. So uh, if, if you have some questions on what number we're using to project, it's not always the exact match to that revenue. So it's like Mr. Bresk, is that the case with business licenses? It looks like we're at. Um, the adopted budget was 820. Yes, sir. That's yes, accurate. That so and do we have a projection of the actual for that number for 19? Uh, Ms. Smith, I, I, you said we believe that, so that 19 is going to be on trend to, to look like the actuals for 17 and 18, correct? That's, that's correct. So, uh, ma'am, ma Mr. Badescu, I mean, you, you described that you don't always use the highs and all that stuff. So what is the methodology? Um, it's, it's a professional assessment and recommendation. And, and so what that is, it, we, I mean, it's, it's not, not like always a, a complete average of a three-year trend. Um, we try to look at, uh, when we sit down and look at some of these projections, uh, were there anomalies in them? Is there anything we shouldn't count on? Um, and so I, I dare say on all the revenues, we, we never really project out the high year on, when we're trying to anticipate our revenues. Uh, and so we get together, when I say we, it's um, generally the folks that are involved in the, in the revenue projecting and collections and those kinds of things and look at sort of the trend and what we're comfortable with. Um, and so that's usually how we get to that recommendation for the board. Have, have you looked at the trend over the years of your, and I'm talking a trend over time, have you looked at the trend of your, uh, your budget and actuals? Yes and we are conservative. To the tune of what percentage overall? Um, I'm not sure I'm assigned a percentage. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could certainly get you the well, answer I was to just, that. I was just kind of, kind of curious if there, if there, if, uh, if you all had come up with a, an idea, because I'm kind of backing into maybe the methodology. If, if you're consistent with four or five percent, then that's, that's kind of telling me that's what you're looking at. I suppose. I, I think Mr. Peterson's correct. I just didn't want to give you a firm number. Uh, we have trended that way. Uh, keep in mind, part of the benefit of being conservative has allowed us to fund uh, prior year operating uh, transfer and the capital. Um, not, not, criti not critical of conservative budgeting, just, just trying to understand it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mr. Chair, if I could, just, just to expand a little bit on that, not a lot. Um, uh, I believe that we assume in the budget that all positions will be filled for the entire year. Right. And then as the year unfolds, uh, some folks depart and then it'll be a break in service. And so it, it's still appropriate to assume everyone, all the positions will be filled. But at, at the end of the year, the reality is that, that very, not very often are all your positions all filled all year long. So there'll be some element that's built in that way. Uh, there'll be other elements as well. And, uh, um, the uh, in in the sources of revenues that we've that we've looked at here, and this is something that maybe I'll challenge as well. Um, the increase in business licenses are as businesses relocate to Gutsen and, and set up shop, and so you may see an increase there. And in a downturn, maybe their activity be off a little bit, but some other ones may be a little more cyclical, like connection fees and building permits and and disturbance fees, which may drop off dramatically. So some sources of revenue may be a little more durable, whereas others may be a little more cyclical. And I think as we budget and go forward, it's those more cyclical ones that we, 
if we continue to be a little conservative on those projections, eventually there'll be a downturn and they, those conservative ones today may prove to be optimistic in a different environment. So it's one of those on average you try and be about right, but in certain years you're gonna be a little more conservative and other years you may be unfortunately a little more optimistic if things drop off a little faster. So with that, I'll just uh, share that with the group. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Dennis Smith, yeah. Academy yeah. Policies. policies for the general fund. This is our current outstanding debt. As you can see, the um, Virginia, or what is it, the Virginia Public School Authority, 1999 will be paid off in 2020. Um, the most recent one is the 2016 lease revenue bond that was <coughs> for the emergency communication system. This is um, debt service, which basically is the definition of it, which equals princi annual principal plus interest. That's what your debt service is. Existing debt service. This is our existing debt. You can see it's going down. Everything looks fantastic. Our policies. The county targets 10% debt service to the expenditure um, of debt service to expenditures, even though the policy is 12%. As of the second quarter, the projection was at 6.93%. The other policy we have is net debt as a percentage of market value of property, and the policy is 2.5%. It was 2.75, and then in, I believe May of last year we dropped it to 2.5. Um, for FY20, we are projecting 1.47%. This is future planned borrowing and what it's for. We have three major projects out there. The Goochland Elementary School, Circuit Court Building, and the West Creek Fire Station. The primary source of funding for these, as you can see, is borrowing. Definitely, just to be clear, there is in the proposed annual budget, there is no proposed borrowing for fiscal year 2020. These are all projects in the out years of the capital improvement plan. Um, and what she's going to share with you now is, is how we prepared uh, ourselves to address those. Reminder, just our capital improvement plan is built upon no tax increase. And so we're using our existing debt service capacity and cash to handle these. And she's going to share with you that. All right. This illustrates the current debt service and proposed new debt. Green is the current, the blue is the new. The annual debt service would increase by about a million and a half, and that's your principal and interest that you pay annually. And this is with the plan. This takes the previous slide and it adds in a few extra things. The green line is the savings or the balance in the debt service fund or cash. And that's how we're um, projecting or planning to cover the gap in between decreasing debt and the new issuance. The red line is our annual debt service payment, or excuse me, the budgeted debt service payments. So I know it's a little confusing, but we're basically putting the cash aside now to cover where we're gonna go over on the amount of annual debt service that we have budgeted to keep us within our policy. And then once, as the cash goes down, the also the debt goes down and we level back out. I think I said that correctly, mm -hmm. and hopefully I didn't confuse you. That's good. Okay. And this is future compliance with policies, debt service to general government expenses. So you can see, I like this little thing, it's kind of cool. Um, you can see 24, that's where we're going to hit our peak on the debt service to general government expenses. And after that, we're going to go, it goes right back down. So we're covered on our policies. And this is all assuming the 1.87% growth and assuming that we borrow as it's laid out in the CIP. Um, the future compliance with the other policy. Again, your peak is in 2023. 
And again, we are well below what our policy is at 2.5%. Well, actually, that line needs to be down a little bit. That's the old 2.75, but it is 2.5 now. Any questions? <coughs> questions on this section? Um, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> I had, when I introduced the budget last time, I said that there were um, some, uh, particularly the schools had made a request uh, that was above the prior five-year balance uh, capital improvement plan. Just a reminder, not a, uh, and we'll probably dive a lot more deeply into this. Dr. Rayleigh's coming on March 5th to give an overview of the school's budget and probably a high level on the CIP request. On March 12th, we have a joint meeting uh, with the school board uh, that will be actually in room 270, a similar meeting that we had last year on, on joint needs. Um, but at that time, the board will be asked to consider some alternatives to um, prioritization of certain projects as I have presented them. Um, we have, uh, at this point, the parameters on any CIP development from the board has been to do it without a planned tax increase with our, within our own capacities. Uh, we would be prepared at that time to sort of talk to you about your options and alternatives, all again within the policies that were just presented to you here today. Any questions? Any other questions? General government. General government is basically made up of administrative, legal, financial, and electoral. General government budget. We're up 3% over FY19. Um, overall, the increases in each department with a few variations, and I'll explain it to them to you when I get there, but so I don't have to repeat myself. Basically, on overall, the personnel costs have increased due to normal salary increases and benefit increases, with the exception of a few. And on operating expenses, we're seeing a lot of, um, or gen in general, increases in telecommunications and software licensing overall. Okay, so the Board of Supervisors, nothing much here. Um, it's basically flat except for the normal salary and benefit increases. Commissioner of Revenue. Now, here's one that's an exception, and I've seen a couple of these. Um, the purse, there was a decrease in personnel due to changes in benefits. Some sort of a change in either the policy they have or something. And then it's been partially offset by the normal increases in salary and benefits. Um, on their operating expenses, that's a combination of dues and telecom expenses. County Administrator, we've got the normal salary increases and benefits. Um, on the operating expenses, most of that, there's some offsets in there, but that is primarily due to the telecom increases. County Assessor's Office, here's another one that's a little different. They've got a request for a part-time employee. So that's that increase and the other normal things. Um, on their operating expenses, it, that they're basically flat with a little bit of a software increase. The county attorney, um, we've got on the operating expenses because the personnel is the same. Um, they've got basically it's copier lease and online legal research dues that's causing the increase there. Finance. Um, we've got a big decrease in operating costs, but that's due to the financial advisor that was hired in FY19 to help us with the Moody's rating. Human resources. They are like the Commissioner of Revenue. There was a change in benefits that's partially offset by the normal salary and benefits increases. Um, and let me see what else. Yeah, they've got an operating increase due to benefits for new volunteers, or excuse me, benefits for volunteers. And also we're reallocating some employee benefits and moving them from other departments into their department. 
if that makes let's, sense. Let's just clarify what benefit for volunteer okay. is. We're now doing all the physical. Er, Kelly, can you just clarify that one? It's not a new benefit. Yeah, we, we've just. Hi, Kelly Parrish. We've just added um, benefits for background checks for the fire department staff for their private investigator. And we also uh, increase the employee assistance program funds because we're now covering the volunteer firefighter staff. Okay. Information technology. We have, again, we have a part-time employee and uh, on their operating costs, their, their biggest hit is telecom. And second to that is software licensing. And but can I address this? The board, you're starting to hear telecom, telecom, telecom. Um, one of the things that we tried to do in this budget is make sure that we were reflecting throughout the, and the departments don't control the telecom themselves. Right. It's a, an expense that's a, applied out to their budgets. We have seen growth in our overall telecom expenses. One of the projects, Randy does in his spare time is trying to evaluate different alternatives to help get our telecom costs down. Um, but for budgeting purposes, uh, we, we do have to try to project out what the actual cost may be per the department. And so that's why you're hearing some of those increase. Um, some of it is just really trying to get them <coughs> appropriately applied to where they were, and they were under budgeted historically. So this is actually correcting some of that, but fundamentally, um, we, we're doing a collective effort that would impact the entire county to try to evaluate alternatives to help reduce those telecom expenses downward. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, oh, just follow up on that. <coughs> so the telecom operating expenses would be in the operating expenses of each department. That's correct. Mm -hmm. It's appropriated out. So the, the capital costs, are those still all in IT? Yeah, I believe the answer to that question is yes. We, on the, and when we replace systems and, and devices, yes. This is the actual billing for service utilization. Is that correct? Gotcha. It, it, it covered in the telecom is also your internet, <coughs> your security, and it's not just the landline you pick up. It's a lot of different things. Mr. Lumpkins, do you have a question? So I see a drop in the operating costs. So That's capital, the 10000 The 10000 is, right, but I've jumped back to, um, I, I wasn't talking so much capital and where it's allocated. We said we have increased telecom and we have increased software licensing. Mm -hmm. Is that reflected on the slide we're looking at? Oh, yes, sir. Is that information technology? Here, I'll show you. See where it says the increase is 38680 That's your operating costs for 2020 proposed. Can't keep it still. So, so it's, it's fine. So it's 9.3% um, over, uh, over adopted. From 2019. But, 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 but 2018 to 2019, right. we had quite a drop. So I'm trying to see what, what happened. I'm not sure, but I will write that down and get back to you on that. Because I see it's I see it's jumped back up, but it's still right. below what it was a couple right. of years, substantially it, below. Well, I know they've moved a lot of the uh, replacement cycle stuff, or equipment to the CIP, so that I, you know, off the top of my head, that could be it, but I'd rather check and and get back with you to be sure. And, and this might be a question for Mr. Mr. Buzzard, but when when did we move to? Uh, Office, putting. I think we're pretty much an Office 365 shop now, right? And so, when when did that transition take place? That move actually predated me, but I believe it was in fiscal year 16. So, did we stop host? Did we did we at that point cut a lot of our own hosting and, and, and servers and that sort of thing that we. we kind of shut that down. I mean, I know we still have some servers, but we got rid of a lot at that time. We got rid of the exchange server okay. at that time. Okay. All right. So has, 
do we have like a what's a license? Do you know what the license? Because when I it caught my ear when you said we have an increase in software licenses, a lot of it Microsoft or is it other other things? It's a, a combination of a lot of things. Microsoft's a big portion of it, probably the biggest percentage. And, and so why is it jumping this year? It, that's just historically how vendors do it. They that's how they make their money on software maintenance. That's how they do their operating budget. Is uh, increases in, in it's it's not because we've had so they've had increase on seat licenses because we pay a flat right we pay a flat fee for each user right depending on the features but that flat fee could go up every year ha and it has been going up since we did this before I know we switched before your time yeah historically any vendor Microsoft whether it's our CAD software any software vendor that we have maintenance on which is our important software that we have to keep maintenance on historically between three to five percent every year they go up wanda does a really good job uh, we try to negotiate that down and get a lower percentage but do we get government pricing from microsoft on we do on, on that i would i wouldn't mind if you, if you just provide it to me later but just to, to show the trend on the microsoft per seat licensing what that's been doing since you've been here and if it's and if that's a significant jump um I, i'm curious to see if that's a significant jump of what what we're talking about here if, if Microsoft and that seat license is a significant yeah, we'll jump. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I can well, I, I, it's, it's, it's just, I, I question it because the, I know that Office 365, it's, it's nice, it's robust, but, but they're supposed to provide, I know we had a problem a few months ago with email getting, I guess, essentially hacked. And I, I don't know if we are re some of our costs reacting to that to add more features. I know you just added a mobile device management NVM component. I guess that's probably an increase in in the in the budget. Yeah, that was added uh, last year actually. Oh, okay. Uh, we right. haven't funded anything for the reaction for the to that yet. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Now we are testing some tools though. Yes. Okay. Yeah, just if I could get a little more granular on, on some of the shifts that you're, you're seeing in terms of licensing, I, I would appreciate it at, at your convenience. Okay. Any other questions? Other questions? Oh. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. <coughs> okay, purchasing. We've got a decrease in the personnel, and that also is due to a, due to a change in benefits offset by your normal increases. And we have an increase in the operating costs, and that's due to um, county logo items partially offset by savings in other departments. The electoral board, we're up here because I guess, or excuse me, normally they have two elections. This year we've got a third election. So they're budgeting for that cost of third election. And the treasurer's office, we have on their personnel, we have an addition of a part-time to a full-time, and they've got savings in their operating costs, and that's due to savings in bank fees and collection costs. And now we're down to the general government CIP projects. Um, this, for FY20, it's only IT department, and they're basically the same as last year with a few changes. Um, you've got your uh, regular replacement items. Um, everything, like I said, is the same. The new permitting software is went up from last year. Um, they were estimating 200, and it's gone up to 430. The best thing about all of this, though, is the voice over IP cloud phone solution where they're looking at implementing this to help save money in telecommunications costs. Any questions? Um, I apologize, just want to actually back up. Mr. Mulligan, can you help clarify a few questions on the electoral board side? Um, I, I know at one point we actually talked that there was a possibility of four elections next year, but right. it's down, actually down to three. Can you talk about those cycles? Um, well, the the reason it's definitely going to be three is because you have um, the 2019 November general and then the 2020 March um, presidential primary and then on primary in June. So that's the definite three. Now we were afraid of because of a lawsuit 
dealing with house boundary lines that there was going to be a second primary in 2019 in September. So that would have been why there would have been four in that one fiscal year. Is that? The one general and then the. Yeah, there would have been a, a late primary in September, the 2019 general, the presidential primary in March, and then a second um, or 2020's primary in June. From what I hear, that House primary in September is no longer. That's no longer. I, I, that's what I, I thought you were including and you're not. Right. That's gone. Right. So that's the one that's gone. I, I've heard some word on the street that that might not be the case, but I'm 90% positive yeah. that that's not going to. Well, who knows? Yeah, but who knows? Correct. So this doesn't include that. This increases just to three that for are the, coming. For the three that are definite. <coughs> Correct. So they won't combine the presidential and I guess is that statewide at that point? Right. No, they're they're always separate. They're going to separate, separate primaries. And March and uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Right. Anything else? Sorry. Mr. Chairman, on, the, on that last but slide, the, the yes, sir. document management system, explain that uh, that uh, funding for future DMS. Do you, that's a 49,000 one-time expenditure. Basically, this year what we're doing, if you turn to, if you look at page 245 in the full-blown budget, you'll see um, the funding for the future document management system and the VOIP, voiceover IP. Um, it's where we're putting money aside again for okay. those projects. I, I don't have it on this piece of paper when we're that's going, okay. That's okay. Them, so, so the idea is that's sort yep. of the part of the pay of pay as you go model yes, that we that we follow. Okay. All right. All right. <coughs> uh, so at some point, that's going to have to be bid out or put out for bid for DMS. Is that is, do we know that to be the case or, or have we? Not heard? sure. Are y'all going to be putting that out for bid? Or do you have a sole source? Uh, at this time, that's undetermined. We're exploring some other options for document management as well. Gotcha. Okay. But the voice over IP is further along, or that's? that's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds if, good. If, we, if it gets approved through CIP right. funding. Gotcha. Okay. It, just to, to your question, there are times that we can either ride state contracts or com uh, competitive procurements that allow for riders that make sense, um, or we would go to a, a, a full-blown procurement. But uh, there are some alternatives to that that we are permitted to use. Uh, through, and, and one that could probably answer it a little bit better, but th there are options for us. I guess it sometimes depends on the. Uh, uh, well, may maybe, maybe I, and I have. Don't want to take up time trying to educate myself on procurement law, but <laughs> but but it but it does depend on the amount, I guess, of, of the project. Where, where what bucket you can kind of fit into, I suppose. There's different approaches you can based on what you're trying to borrow, but I'm not sure that amount necessarily follows things that have already gone through competitive procurements that allow riders. Gotcha. Wanda, you want to correct me? You're welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're talking about the strategy for Ooh, sorry. Okay, I got it. You're talking about the strategy for procurement or yeah, what are the IP? thresholds that require us to bid and then when we go to use competitive procurement tools are are there dollar thresholds that you're required to use? Well, the county ad adopted thresholds are um, 30,000 for three quotes. 100,000 takes a, f a form of solicitation. However, at any time, the county can decide that it's in our best interest to take the solicitation out at any threshold amount. Okay. So basically, it's, it's a decision based on the commodity at that time. And gotcha. let's say that commodity costs 150,000, but it was competitively procured by a state contract or another jurisdiction. We are allowed to purchase off of that tool without doing the, the otherwise 
That's that. correct. Once we go over the 100,000, we have other um, procurement opportunities, cooperative, state, uh, VITA, and then whether or not we want to do it ourselves. Thank you. And that's the case on any procurement we do. Um, sometimes it's more beneficial for regional procurements like Henrico, Chesterfield, Hanover, where they've done a regional procurement, and it's a larger quantity, so we benefit off of using one of their cooperative regional contracts. <laughs> so, so we're setting for the budget is setting fifty thousand dollars aside for something we're not quite sure what we're doing yet in terms of the DMS. Th that's correct. We haven't finalized it, but uh, we they certainly have looked at it and tried to estimate out what some of these systems are going to cost. Um, at some point, we will do a make a decision and recommendation to you on what tool we're going to use to make that investment. Right. Thank, thank you. Uh, this will still have to come to the board for approval and so on. Oh, yeah. Um, so you'll get to see this a number of additional times, but right. this will, again, show up. Do we, uh, do we have a, a selection? Uh, I know these document man management systems can be complex. Do we have a selection selection process <coughs> on how we're going to decide what what to go with? I guess. Do you have a group of folks looking at it, or You're talking about DMS? Mm -hmm. Yes, we've been looking at it for I a imagine few our months. Attorney we is a, involved. And we have a core team of uh, four or five people. We've evaluated a number of vendors and. Uh, works right now we're exploring an option uh, with SharePoint that hopefully will cost a lot less than going out to a traditional DMS vendor. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing no. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> IT, CIP. Okay. So the, the future outlook, changing regulations and requirements, that would be GASB is a big one on that one, and they always have something new that they want us to implement when doing the CAFR. Um, increasing workloads, implementing the new financial system, which we're doing very well with. Um, so that's our future outlooks and challenges. And any questions? Any other questions? On this item? Real quickly on commissioner, uh, commissioner of revenue, um, and this is again, lot bringing bringing me up to speed. Do we have a, a line item of what the state compensation board pays for that? Do we know? Do we have a, a number of projected revenue? <coughs> yes, sir. Do, we, do, and we include it in the budget as well. Okay, so that's in that's every constitutional officer where there's a number that the state compensation board pays. That's that's factored in. Yes, sir. What we're looking at. Yes, sir. So we can't. Well, okay. I, just, I have to look at the big picture to get. I guess this doesn't show us. This is not our portion. You have to look at this book. Yeah, got to go back yeah. to the book. Yeah. Go to the other. To see the I'm details. Trying to, big book, trying to get all my answers in one slide. That's not working. I guess. Yeah, on slide five, where, it, where their budget is, or the overview of their budget summary, there is a revenue line. Um, which mostly is, but you, you'd want to go to the details to see the exact. Right, right, right. And I think I've got it on the slide. It's on page 50 of the proposed budget, the big book. Right, I'm, I have it open, on, but it's hard for me to jump. It's 444 pages. And I, I, I haven't figured out how to, <laughs> how to do anything other so than open it into this slide. Um, okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we look at uh, the state compensation board? And I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know how that works other than they don't pay a whole lot. Um, you're certainly always welcome to look at it. I, I, I can say in my tenure, not only here, but it, they so underfund the departments to actually operate. Um, and that's why we do the supplemental relationships with not with every constitutional officer. Um, and so it, um, we don't rely on an annual increase too dramatically different than prior years so that even when the state says they're giving state employees funds, um, everyone's treated here as if they're a county employee. Um, and so the state revenues do not fluctuate tremendously from year to year. Yeah, I, I just have their page open. I'm looking at the board, and they have a scale of what. So as far as we know, though, they are paying us what they say their scale. Um, 
that's that's our understanding of the commitment from the state i don't believe we would have any of the departments funded if we were only able to hire what the comp board provides i just totally understand it's just a fraction but and there's nothing we can do other than accept whatever they pay right i mean i guess it's a i guess is there anything that we should be look are we being shortchanged in any way and that is there is there um i think it's a fair question because we know in across the board that they're not compensating to levels um that would provide a competitive office environment within the jurisdictions um i think certainly your advocacy level is not only is our efforts through state legislation and those kinds of things to get them brought up um i i think back when i was a member participating with vaco that was one of their priorities every year i i've been here 15 years and haven't seen them make any headway in in 15 years in virginia um and so with the exception i think i had seen some changes on the the sheriff funding over the years but for treasurers commissioner revenues and some of you guys are in the room i don't think they've made any substantial changes in years to the base funding for those positions Okay, treasurer would have two employees. Treasurer would have two. Okay. Good. Thank. So, Mike. Don't say that. <laughs> she, she, she doesn't have a mic. Okay, your, heard your that. three minutes are up. <laughs> <laughs> She's not in the microphone then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think it's it's almost like when people people have managed their budget based on what they're going to get on the tax return, <laughs> and if they get something, they go, "Yes, this is great." Yeah. It's almost like that with the state. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. One more. Oh, wrong mouse. <coughs> This will be judicial administration. Okay, we're starting with the circuit court. Um, basically, the circuit court, uh, they share authority with the general district court at certain monetary levels. Um, they handle all civil over 25,000 and appeals from the general district court and the juvenile domestic relations court. Budget is up just a little bit, and it is due to telecommunications. Again, um, they did have a small drop in um, contracted services, or excuse me, in jurors, but the contracted services went up the same amount. Clerk of the Circuit Court. Um, the clerk handles uh, your child support claims, small claims, jurors, You've got the probate, uh, deeds, filing vital records. That's basically the responsibility of the clerk of the circuit court. And it, it, it is a lot more. I was just kind of giving you a little run over. Um, these personnel increases, again, are due, the, due to the normal salary and benefit increases. 
they have an increase in their operating expense, and this elaborates on more on the next page. They, um, they received what is called a $10,000 non-reverting revenue, and so we've increased their ex operating expenses by 10000 so they can spend the money. It's their money. Um, and I believe Ms. Johnson explained that to us at the last meeting. Um, another good thing about the clerk of the circuit court was the new $5 per case fee that's going to be used for the constru courthouse construction. Okay, I just uh, wanted to talk the non-reverting uh, mm -hmm. funds. We, and we, we shared with you, we, we used to come with you off budget cycle with some of these funds and appropriate them throughout the middle of the year. I think we just did this for the clerk four months ago, maybe three months ago. Uh, we're trying to, when it makes sense that there's annual offsetting expenditures budget for these versus trying to bring them in mid-year. I think this is the first one of these you're seeing like this. The, the $5, the $5 case fee. I want to look, is, is that the recording? Is that the five dollar bill? Or is that the other thing? That's what. And that's what we passed recently. Yes, that's the one. I don't know why I thought it was three dollars, but it's five dollars per ci case per civil criminal um, per case. Okay. Uh, and just so you know, how I don't want to confuse that issue on that one. Um, it's for any case, correct? The one on the courthouse fee, there was special legislation that allowed the clerks to collect that. We actually had to get um, approval from state general services that deemed our courthouses in need um, to be able to qualify for the, the fee. I think, uh, Ms. McGee, as part of our fee structure as we move forward, we would actually be adopting that that fee, it would go into a fund for use when we ultimately did the construction. Uh, we had some projections that by the time we actually build that courthouse based on the current CIP, uh, that, that those total collections can be in excess of 25000 per year to contribute to that project. And I just want to clarify, um, we currently collect a $2 fee which can go to maintenance and some utility expenses of the current, current house. The new $3 fee has to be for the construction of a new courthouse. But the total, they're not replacing one another. Keeping with the two and adding the three, the three can only go to new construction. So I did remember correctly, we, we okay. just added three. Thank you. So it's a total of five. So it's. Gotcha. Uh, that's three. There's my three and two. Any other questions? Four. Okay. Okay. Continue. All righty. Now we're on to the Commonwealth Attorney, who basically prosecutes cases and manages the Victim Witness Program. We've got the normal salary benefit increases, and we have a reduction in telecommunications. For one, <laughs> um, this is a little bit more description of the primary functions. Uh, um of the general district court which is small Smith, cases just real quickly if you don't mind before you leave the commonwealth attorney um, mike uh, uh, as technology would have it we just saw a notice pop up about potential additional body cam footage i know there was a bill related to that you, i don't know if it ended up passing or not or do we know if there's a and we didn't plan on an additional fiscal impact but do you know if that may be something we need to consider um, Mike Cordell, Commonwealth Attorney. Um, we got notice by the comp board that for jurisdictions with 75 or more body cameras, we get to have uh, another assistant, but I don't know if the bill passed, whether anything like that went into law. They could have written the budget. We'll, we'll track that to make sure okay. if there's an implication. Well, I, I can find out and let somebody know if they're interested. Right now, we wouldn't hit that 75 threshold. No, I think we have, we have about, what, 30, 35 cameras? Yeah, state police don't have any. So we're a few years away where we'd even qualify yes. for that threshold. That's right. They don't get cameras. You have a camera. <laughs> okay. General District Court. These are the smaller cases and preliminary felony cases. Their budget 
is up 2150 and that is due to telecom. Next is what we were discussing earlier, the new courthouse building. It's planned, um, it's still on track in the CIP for 2023. The issues they face um, over there is, of course, the lack of space and security. Any questions? Mr. Lumpkin. <laughs> no, no questions, thank you. No, no. questions, okay. Anybody else? Uh, other questions? Uh, just okay. just one, if you don't mind. Um, on the CIP for, i make sure I'm in the right spot here, uh, the general district court. So yes, in the CIP we pushed the new court building forward uh, but we also are going to do some um, other improvements uh, in the five years. I think what you're referring to, correct me if I'm wrong, is we've come up with a plan that if for some reason the board reprioritizes current capital improvement project that would include the, the new court building, we would act we would be planning some interim funding to bridge and extend the life gotcha. of the existing facilities. Right. This and so true. if we're on track now, we probably won't make any substantial investments in the current facilities. However, if they get delayed for, for any particular reason, we have a plan to make some interim investments to extend the life of the facility. Gotcha. That makes sense. Thank so you. So this that conversation is pending our meeting with the school board it depends on everything. next yeah. week and <laughs> okay. what we decide to do about the schools as well. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions? Or no? So I believe Mr. Mr. Kildup is next. taller than Kathleen. Let me pull this thing forward here. All right, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Todd Kilduff, Deputy County Administrator for Community Development and Economic Development, and I'm also going to be presenting the Public Utilities um, budget to you this evening. Uh, it's actually broken into three pieces, really, and Barbara was sort of my partner. We usually tag team this every year. Um, it is unfortunate that she's out, but I'm happy to do her portion of this presentation, which is more geared towards the Tuckahoe Creek Service District. Uh, but moving directly into the public utilities portion of this, um, and I should start by saying uh, we'll go ahead and do the public utilities portion um, and then take any questions on that, the rates, the Tucko Creek Service District questions, um, and then I'll roll into the community development as, as opposed to pushing it all together. So I think it might be a little bit easier. Uh, so public utilities, their pro some of their primary functions are to provide the highest quality water and wastewater services to our customers operate and maintain all of our public utility assets. Uh, all the quantities that you see in those parentheses there, they're increasing every single year. As a matter of fact, this next year, the probably next year's presentation, there's gonna be eight sewer pump stations listed because of the one that's going in for Swans Inn, as well as the miles of pipe that we operate and maintain. That's gonna increase uh, due to all the development activity that we're seeing on the east end of the county. Um, and also to be transparent with all department actions. Our goals are to set the industry standard for safety, technology, and industry knowledge. And I feel, I'm, I'm actually happy to report that I feel that we meet that mark every single year. Uh, safety is listed first for a reason, because it's always number one. I say that every year, so hopefully it doesn't become white noise, but it is number one. We want to make sure that all of our employees that are out there in the field that are dealing with high hazard conditions, uh, electrical wiring, construction projects, backhoes, cranes, things like that. We want to make sure that at the end of the day, everyone goes home safe and sound. Uh, address all emergencies in an expeditious and professional manner and identify and address any relevant projects that are identified in the 2015 utility master plan. 
and I can't believe it's been four years since we did that plan. Uh, we plan on looking at, at that again in, in the next year as well uh, to have a, uh, we told you when we did the plan, we wanted to look at it every five years. And when we look at it, well, we, we use it every day, but when we look at it again, we'll see how much the plan has actually changed because the growth on the east end of the county has grown in different areas and there's different uses and things like that. So it's gonna be pretty exciting to hop back into that plan and, and update it. Uh, but the good news out of that plan is the water and sewer model that we did. It's a great program to have. It's actually been very beneficial to us and, and the development community whenever they come in our office and say, hey, we wanna do X project and we think we might have this much water associated with it. We can punch some figures and just give them some high level numbers on what that actually means. And when that pro project comes to fruition, we actually type in their data in our system and it's always updated. So that's one thing that we don't have to do this next round for the utility master plan. Uh, for personnel, uh, you'll see an increase on the top right there. It's a 16% increase, but it's really due to the addition of two positions. Uh, and you see the, the full-time positions at the bottom in the bottom chart there. I'll explain what those are and why you have that 0.3 there. It seems a little funky, but that's really my salary. 0.3 of my salary is on public utility sides. 0.3 is on economic development. The other 0.3 is on um, the community development side. So you'll see that 0.3 in those presentations. From the capital projects, uh, you'll see the first number in, in, in uh, FY19 was the $2.4 million. That was for the Hickory Haven sewer line project. Uh, we're happy to report that the project's well underway. I do have a, a slide later that explains a little bit more about that, but it's already in the engineering phase, uh, which we're very happy about, and the neighborhood's been informed, and they're very much welcoming this project. Uh, the million, the million dollars uh, request for 2020, um, <clears throat> that is actually uh, two projects. One is a project that's been on the CIP uh, ever since the 2015 utility master plan was completed and, and this, these projects were identified. It's the courthouse wastewater treatment plant. That project was actually farther down on the list. I believe it was maybe 10 years out off the top of my head. It's actually been pushed forward because every, every time a new development comes in, it brings us closer and closer to tapping out the wastewater allocation that we have with the Department of Corrections uh, here in the courthouse. The other item is a booster pump station upgrade. That's a new item. Um, we already have the booster pump. It's a chloramine booster pump station. If you're not familiar with it, Mr. Lumpkins, you weren't here when we actually went through that exercise. Uh, it actually injects chloramines into the water system on the east end of the county because we were having some water quality issues. The station is working great. It's actually increased the water quality. We're having, we had a significant drop in calls and we were getting calls on a weekly basis before that station went into service. And we did a few other upgrades as well. We took a, a tank offline. Um, we uh, put um, a mixer in our Centerville water tank and a few other things. I can explain what all that is a little bit later if you want. Uh, but just know we, we increased the water quality. What this, what this request is for is because of the amount of chemicals that we're using, it actually is starting to exceed the space that we already had allocated in our existing water booster pump station. We were trying to save space by using our existing structure that we had out there, and it's just not working anymore. So we figured if we need to build onto our existing chloramine booster pump station, add, let's say, if, you're, if you were to see it, it's basically like two or three garage doors just right next to each other. Adding another space, a four space next to it, um, it would also be advantageous to make that a workspace as well, since there isn't any other workspace in the northeast, northeast end of the county for our operation and maintenance workers. Um, this adds a place for them to go to. We have been renting a space in a, in a place on, on Mannequin Road, but again, that's renting a place. This is something that we can have and it would have our own internet access and things like that. So that's that request. Uh, the two positions, one is a construction superintendent and the other is a utility locator. And when I get to the building inspections presentation here in a little bit, um, there's actually one position that would be for all of community development, just one position there. But utilities is requesting two positions. Um, we, we are very careful when we request new positions. Uh, and to, to be at the point where we need to, um, we really do need these two positions. We are at a point where we're starting to not meet some of our measurements, starting to not meet some of our goals. Uh, let me just talk about the construction superintendent first. Uh, the construction superintendent, we spend about $40,000 a year minimum on our consultants to go out and do construction inspections for us because there's just so many projects on the east end of the county right now. Um, with those construction inspections, if you couple that with the capital improvement projects that we have, for example, Hickory Haven, Old Oaks Lane subdivision, and you also wrap in all the R&R work that was identified in the rate study we did last year, that's renewal and replacement 
this renewal and replacement of our existing infrastructure. Uh, most sewer and water infrastructure has like a 50 year life. So we or, we're already starting to plan for that. We need somebody who solely can focus on construction inspections and manage those projects. So it's a construction superintendent, but it focuses on the administration and management side as well as being in the field as well. The utility locator, this one's interesting. We had talked and tossed around this idea of having an actual utility locator for a few years, uh, but we've had the operation and maintenance staff whenever a missed utility ticket calls in. And basically that's a free service for, for anyone listening. Uh, let me explain real quick what that is. If you're putting in a new fence or a, a mailbox or planting new trees or something like that in your yard, you call Miss Utility, it's a free service. It's 811 on your phone. What that does is it triggers uh, an alert to us and we go out and we put blue spray paint on the ground for water or green spray paint on the ground for sewer. It's really what we do. Um, We've had over, I think it's around 3,200 tickets just this past year, which is about an average of 12 per day. What that means for the operation and maintenance staff that's actually doing those tickets, they have them all split up in the zones. If they're fixing a pump or fixing a meter or talking to a resident about an issue they may be having, as soon as they get that alert, they kind of have to take a pause, get in their truck, go mark the ground, come back, and then re re resume where they were at. And it's an impact to their day because it's not easy to constantly be broken up from what you're doing. Um, so we're at a point now where we feel having an actual utility locator on staff, and that's really their sole duty is something that we desperately need so that the operation maintenance guys can do what they're supposed to be doing. Mr. Yes, sir. Just to be clear, it's a free service to the constituent and resident. Mm -hmm. We underwrite some of that, partly because mm -hmm. we want to make sure that as people go to do the dig on their property, they're not disrupting and causing interruptions to our system. Um, and I impacting our utilities as well that will impact our customer base and those kind of things. So we do it for our utilities, others do it for um, you know, their gas and yeah, other, ki right. other kinds of utilities as well. So there is a cost to, to, to us to offer that service, but it's yeah. also important for us to offer it so we minimize those impacts. That's right, that's right. Yeah, so it, it, is, it is a free service to citizens. Uh, for every ticket that's called in, I believe it's a dollar fifty, a dollar and five cents. We actually get charged. It sounds a little silly, but that's how it works. Um, so our bill from Miss Utility every month is about three hundred bucks. It's really not that expensive, three hundred to three hundred fifty dollars. But it's also the staff time going out into the field and doing these markings. or staff time associated with it. Plus, we buy equipment to be able to do the markings. It's not just spray paint. There's actual equipment that we have to use to be able to locate the line that's underground. On the operation side. Uh, there's, there's a few increases. These are just a few reasons, reasons why. Um, nothing major, but there's some large and small meter purchases that we're making. There's a lot of, uh, we try to have uh, ample stock of meters on hand. So when all, all these new houses that we're seeing go online, we have them ready. Uh, incremental budget increases and decreases to match um, the spending trends. We watch really closely um, over the uh, uh, several year period what our trends are actually looking like if something is going up we try to match that and stay up if it's going down we try to go down and match that uh, we've also had multiple upgrades to our SCADA network uh, that, that we completed um, and the SCADA network just to refresh your memory and I know Mr. Lumpkins you haven't heard this the board's heard it numerous times that's supervisory control and data acquisition it's basically a fancy way of saying that that's our system's brains while we're at home at night and on the weekends so if there's a pump that fails or high pressures, low pressures in the system, something that would cause an issue for our citizens and our, and our users, it would send an alert to our phones and we can actually address it either on our laptop from home or we may actually have to mobilize to the site and, and address the issue. So that's really what that is. So it's very important to us. I've already mentioned the chloramine booster station and the courthouse wastewater treatment plant. That dollar value with the wastewater treatment plant is not the full dollar value that would be needed for the, the project. This is really just for the engineering phase and to get it kicked off. As a matter of fact, we're meeting with the Department of Corrections. Uh, we already had a meeting with them on uh, engaging their interest. Uh, we're going to have another meeting set up, I believe it's at the end of March, to continue, con to continue the dialogue um, to get that project moving forward, if that's what the board chooses to do as far as the recommendation. <laughs> I've already mentioned Miss Utility. Um, there's the breakdown. Just leave the DOC oh, issue sure. much further. Um, for those that don't know, uh, in the courthouse area, we do not have our own wastewater treatment plant. And so as we look to, to meet the capacity needs in the courthouse area, DOC is that provider. And so we would be working with them to actually expand the on-site treatment there that would actually take care of the courthouse needs. And so we have to coordinate anything we do um, with them. The money that we have in the budget 
is for the beginning of the design of that project. This is cash. Uh, should we ultimately get to the point where we make the full investment, we have in out years planned borrowing um, for for this total project. But the next two years have cash infusions. Um, if we go into the full construction, we would look at a debt. This this kind of system will have a lifespan uh, well beyond 50 years. It does make sense to be a debt consideration. Um, and but the actual construction will not happen for at least three years, most likely much longer. Probably minimum, yeah. Yeah, there's a few things, a few logistical items that need to be set in place with, with the DOC prior to that. But I can tell you, and I'm happy to report, that the first meeting we had with them, they were very amenable to our request. So we'll see where that goes. And we'll update you that on that as, as, it, as it moves forward. Moving into the accomplishments, uh, every year we actually provide a full annual report from the Community Development Department that has accomplishments in it. Um, but we just wanted to give you maybe some of the higher level items from the Utilities Department and then I also have some accomplishments on the Community Development side when I get to that presentation. Uh, but I've already mentioned the missed utility tickets. Uh, we actually completed a wastewater pretreatment agreement with the city of Richmond. While that's one bullet point, just please know that that was probably two years in the making. Uh, we have been working diligently with the city of Richmond trying to get this pretreatment agreement in place, and we are very thankful for the board support in helping us make that happen, and as well as uh, Tara for um, helping us push that forward and, and talking to the city of Richmond's lawyers as well. Um, and we also su successfully negotiated and improved payment structure uh, just with the, with, with the city of Richmond. What they were doing was sending us one bill, and that one bill had a lot of stuff included in it. It was sort of our monthly fee for them treating our wastewater, uh, but it was also our debt that we have with them. So it was really one number with a lot of things loaded into that one number, and we wanted to separate that. We said, let's have a bill just for our debt, and we'll take care of that over here on the side, and then send us a monthly bill like you would a normal utility customer in the city of Richmond, and we'll pay for that on, on this side. Um, it took a long time to get to the point where everyone came to an agreement on that, but we're happy to report that, that, that we did. Uh, sampling our wastewater, it's something that we had not done until just this past year. I believe I reported last year was we had just started the program. Uh, we always are testing our water. Um, that's required by state, but we request our water. This is wastewater testing, so it's different. We want to make sure that with this new agreement we have with the city of Richmond that we were good to go and we were not in violation of the agreement or any limits that they have on their end for treating our wastewater. Um, so that's why we started testing our own wastewater for whatever constituents are in it, and we're happy to report that we're pretty good across, across the board. And we also completed a triennial industrial pretreatment survey, and what that is is we send that to all of our customers, um, all of our commercial customers, and ask them to fill in the information that's in it, send it back to us, and then we actually will send that to Henrico County, and it's really just our customers reporting what they're actually putting in the wastewater system as well. Um, so it's sort of a back check, uh, but it is required by Henrico for us to do that. Another good accomplishment, as mentioned earlier, uh, the Old Oaks subdivision project, this is sort of a win-win-win. It's not just a win-win, it's a win-win-win for the county, for our citizens, as well as for the state and the taxpayers, because this project, if you recall, was um, not the entire development, but I, I believe there's only about eight houses in, in that neighbor neighborhood that had petroleum contaminated well water. So Department of Environmental Quality had gone to those houses, they put in carbon filtration units to help treat the water so people can wash dishes and take showers and things and, and have a water system. Uh, but that was not their ultimate goal. Their ultimate goal was to get them on a public system. Uh, our system just happens to be too far away. But Aqua Virginia has a system that's right there in Crozier. Uh, so um, everyone's pretty much familiar with this project, but the engineering is now complete. The construction contract was awarded at the beginning of this month, and they're ready to move forward with the project. And the expected completion is September 30th of this year. So the residents are very excited. Uh, DEQ, we had a whole phone call with them, and they were so appreciative of, of everything we've done. This is a zero cost to the county. However, it is staff time. So it's impacted the utility staff, the procurement staff. Tara's been involved. Um, so there's been a lot of people involved from the county's perspective. Um, it's zero cost, but it is county, county time. But um, we are doing this project almost, and this is according to DEQ, um, about two years faster than they could have done it on their end. So we're very happy about that. For future outlooks and challenges, we're going to continue to monitor our system for water pressures and quality. Uh, we've been doing, we always do that, but more specifically after all the, the changes we had in the utility master plan uh, to our system, it's something that we're, we're always looking at. Uh, manage the system 
with a number of new accounts growing. Uh, we have about approximately a 4% growth every year. I think it was maybe one or two new houses. Matt can correct me. Um, every single week this past year, uh, maintain responsiveness towards current and future utility construction projects. And as mentioned, we do have those few CIP projects. And even though this, one of the, the projects we're considering, one, one of our projects is Old Oaks, it's not listed on there, but that is something that, that we're working on, so. Moving into the rate portion. Last year, uh, well, probably about a year and a half ago now, we contracted with uh, Drape Raiden, a local engineering firm. Um, they specialize in doing rate studies. Uh, we had them look at our rates, um, our rates, our debt, and um, basically all of our revenue and expenses across the board and come up with a rate study for us. And we, we asked them back then, and, and actually uh, Cheryl Stevens is the one that presented it to you a year ago. We said, what is that worst case scenario? And she presented that last year. We said, if we had to do everything we said we needed to do and have everything fully funded, what would that, ha what would that do to the rate structure? Even though we know we wouldn't go that route, we would have much lower rates, but what would that rate be? And if you recall, she said it was about 30% increase on the water and 70% on the sewer. That's a massive increase. Not anything we would do, and we knew that, but we wanted to know what that go-to number was. We needed that goal so we knew what we had to work to and what we had to adjust in our budget every, this year, next year, and every year moving forward to be able to accommodate for those types of increases. Um, so what the final verdict from the rate study showed was a 5% increase on water and a 6% increase on wastewater over the next five years. FY19 is the first year of that, so we're also recommending FY20 be that same number because that's what the rate study was showing. Um, so again, we're already in year one, we're just considering this year two of that study. So what does that mean for our customers? Well, looking at our minimum charge, or our, our minimum usage, our minimum usage is 4,000 gallons. If you use less than that, you're still getting billed a minimum charge. So across the board, if you add the water and sewer in the bottom right, you'll see about $5.51 uh, for an increase for that 5% and the 6%. And that's a bi-monthly bill, by the way. So if I go back to this, if you're using the minimum, you'll see on the very bottom middle, it says $103. That's bi-monthly. So I think we have some of the best deals in town is what we've heard from some of those that are other privatized utility customers. Uh, that's about $50 a month. Uh, from what they're telling us, they're paying almost double that in certain areas of the county and other counties as well. John, uh, just oh, before you yes. move on, just uh, one of the things, we t you mentioned the rate study, but I think it's real clear you're going to go into the TCSD here in a minute. Um, the utility system is completely different than anything we've talked about on the general fund side. It is operated as a uh, enterprise fund, which you're on the operating side, utility user rates offset the operations and, and, and maintenance side of the day-to-day -day operations of utilities. Our connection fees pay for the system enhancements and improvements and expansions, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then on the TCSD side, what's collected there pays back the primary uh, utility infrastructure that was uh, purchased and installed for the creation of the TCSD. That's what the, the, the additional ad valorem tax is for in that district. In addition of the, the commercial and, and um, Kenlock pay 55% 50, of their annual tax collection also go, increase in tax collection goes to pay back that obligation. So the utility fund, it's very segmented, if you will, of what revenues go to what types of expenses. And when we recommend any kind of user rate increase, we're always sensitive to the impact to the end user. But we're also, that's where if we get increases in costs from Henrico and purchase, that gets built into there. As we look at the need to maintain and support operations with support staff or improvements on the operations and maintenance side, that's built into the user rate side. And as Todd said, that was projected to go substantially higher. We ratcheted it back to, um, some would say even five and six is, is substantial. I don't want to dispute that, but it's substantially less than what we would, would have needed to, to outpace an, an earlier planned investment strategy. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of much more incremental. Uh, we didn't want to pass those kind of rate increases on to our, to our customers, but um, this is for those planned um, impacts to, to maintaining the system. When we, 
we are still a very young utility system. And uh, while we have a large land service area, uh, we don't have the customer base that can spread some of these costs like other utilities have. And so um, uh, that's w it's sort of a measured approach to how we, we implement that. Um, and it is consistent with our, our plan investments and costs that we incur as a utility uh, to get passed along um, to, to the end user. Todd, the one thing um, that uh, we had presented earlier, and I, I apologize I didn't catch it earlier, can you talk about the connection fees? Oh, and how we're using those for um, and the, the CIPs? Increase for the connection fees. Oh, oh. Um, yeah, we had, uh, and uh, actually sort of two things. Uh, to thank you, Mr. Badesky, for uh, elaborating on that. Um, yeah, the connection fee portion based on the rate study. Uh, the, the rate study, if you recall, is last year, but it really changed the entire view of how we viewed the utilities budget. It was really one budget used for everything. Uh, the connection fees are used specifically for capital improvement capital improvement projects now. Water connection fees go to water projects, sewer connection fees go to sewer projects. Um, what we did was we actually benchmarked uh, our connection fees, which haven't we haven't raised those ever since I've been with, employed with the county over, over six years. We are requesting uh, increases in the connection fees. I don't remember off the top of my head what the percentage was. Um, Matt, I don't know if There you go, thank you, Matt. Um, we benchmarked off of all of our other localities, and on some fronts, we were significantly lower than some of our other localities. I remember when Ms. Dixon was here, we had proposed um, some rate increases, um, and um, I think she didn't want to bring this forward, uh, for ma mainly from an economic development standpoint. Hey, let's get some good rates. We had, a, um, we had a, an apartment complex that was coming. It was our very first apartment complex. Uh, the McDonald's was coming in, the Taco Bell, and several, if you recall, several years ago, we had all these projects that were coming in the door, and we wanted to help start to facilitate and foster uh, the growth on the east end of the county. Um, but now we're at a point where we feel we're significantly, not just lower, but significantly lower than some of our neighbor cal counties, uh, Henrico County, Chesterfield. We benchmarked all the, the typical counties that we benchmark off of, um, and we saw that we were lower. The only one that we weren't lower than and I don't think anybody's going to beat them. It's, it's the city of Richmond. They basically, I mean, I don't want to say their connection fees are zero, but they're so low that nobody's going to match them because they really want to facilitate anybody coming to the city. So there's no way anybody's ever going to come close to what their rates are just because they're so low. Uh, but they're the only locality that was lower than us. Even with the proposed increases, we didn't, didn't have a concern that it was going to disproportionately put us in anything that would impact economic development as we go forward. Those connection fees, right. again, are for new customers. It has no impact to the existing customers. Uh, it's for folks that would come on the system after adoption. Yeah. So that's the increase portion. Uh, there was some language addition that we wanted to have to that as well um, in, in, the, in the code section. Uh, we, were at, we have some new uses um, from the planning standpoint and zoning standpoint. There's retirement life community, continuing care retirement community, things like that that, weren't all, were, that were not addressed in our connection fee code. So we did, we are requesting to add some language to that to make it a little more clear to our future customers. And I'm sorry, does somebody have a I question? Think Mr. Said so. Oh, yes. Well, just a couple things. I'm, I'm trying to follow up. And Mr. Besky, what you said a few moments ago about a young utility don't have the user base to spread it. And, and, am, I, am I out of line to, to take that to mean that any new user is a, is a positive step? I mean, and I'm thinking in terms of we have some things coming before us here, um, potential uh, subdivisions in the courthouse area, for instance, and, and in, in, in the Tucko Creek Service District. Is, are, have, have we, have we um, is our model in these new rates, is it to the point that we can kind of safely say a new user is a positive financial impact? If I just have a utilities hat on only, uh, because it operates as an enterprise fund, it's just like any other business. More customers, more revenue. Um, you, can, you can obviously share those costs uh, alone. So from a utilities perspective, they planned a system for growth um, and to handle additional users. That, that does, in some way, discount the impact of the other services on the general government side, but from a pure utility standpoint, that would be accurate. So in other words, we sell a gallon of water, we're not losing when we sell a gallon of water. The cost of that gallon of water is, we're recovering that and then some. Yeah, we're, we're fully covered on all that, yep. Well so that's, already, that's already passed on. That's already passed on. 
a major increase, uh, I mean, I guess we should, a, a major increase of water would also be spread to all the customers, and they would still pay it. But uh, I guess it's other maintenance and that kind of thing that where the more customers you have, the more you can spread those costs. Because we basically pay Henrico for our water, we pay the city for our sewer, and right. we pass those costs to our users every month or every two months. So it's other changes that would that you could spread across mo the more customers you could pay. So, so, so the model is, I mean, and uh, we've talked about this when I first came on the board, uh, uh, shifting to a, a viable model, well, I guess is what we'd say, to where the, the, the rates for the water, the, the income from the water covers the cost of the water, and I guess what you pointed out, some maintenance and maintenance yes. element. The, the, oper the operation side, yes. The operation side. The, yes, sir. But, but the connection fees, we're trying to move to the model where the connection fees support purely the capital side. Yeah, and we have we have done that. That, and, and that was done during now. the last budget cycle, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, and, and even though we're a young system, yeah. um, we have moved to it being 100% self-sustaining. In fact, there was a loan made from the general fund uh, that – uh, I believe it's There's next a slide year. In here. We'll, oh. we'll, uh, that will be paid off, yeah. and so the utility system is completely self-sustaining. Some other young systems still rely on general fund transfers. We are not one of them, and so we, we uh, our system has become uh, independent, and those rates help keep it that way. So that may, if I may, that might be a jumping-off point for me to go back. You don't, you don't have to go to the slide, but your slide four was um, was the. FY 2020 Departmental Budget Utility Counties Fund, and it had the revenues, and it said at the bottom, C page 226 of the proposed budget. So I went to there because what I, and, and I may have zoned out while I was scrolling to trying to get to here, and you may have answered the question, but I was, can, I was puzzled about the one, basically the $1 million drop in revenue. And I, I think I see it, though, when I look at 226, and there's a contributed capital of over a $1 million made in FY 2018. Is that what you're mm -hmm. speaking of? That, and so that's, that's the last of those is, is, is the plan. Um, actually, I think there's one more in the, uh, the current Yeah, I think there's year. one or maybe two more off the top of my head. Uh, moving so what, forward, is, what is yeah, that? It hasn't fully what is contributed itself. capital then? What is that, that one point, $1.067 million that we did in FY18? What, what is that? all about. Uh, I'm sorry, what was your question? I was flipping through the slide. <laughs> no, no um, it's a, it's, it, to me, it's the difference, the $1 million. I was looking for a, a $1 million drop in revenue. To explain this in your slide, the $1 from, million dollar from drop From FY18 in to 19, the drop? And, and, and on the 226, the bottom. Now, there, I, I could have some questions on why is Henrico yeah, County sharing, the Henrico cost sharing dropping 300000 Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a big one. Yeah, that that kind of. Uh, I, I'm wondering if that's conservative budgeting or is that. Yeah, so th with Henrico, they actually we have a different rate than their than their own utility customers have. So every year we try to get as close as we can to match their budget because at the end of the year we do what's called a true up. We go back in and we take all of our expenses and based on. Um, there's a lot more to it than this, but just know that there's a true up at the end of the year where you go back and see who's over and who's under. Sometimes they have to cut us a check to make everything square, and sometimes we have to cut them a check to make everything square. So based on the last lookout, it turned out that we were, um, and I can't remember off the top of my head, I think a little bit lower, which is why we lowered that well, number. Well, in FY 2018, it was $1.9 million, and, and now you're budgeting $1.6. Yeah, um, that's about right. So... But that didn't. When I was looking for a million, I, I didn't. I didn't. I did, couldn't see it. Couldn't see the million until I got to the bottom, and I saw contributed capital of over a million dollars. Um, and um, but you're saying don't, don't want to spend that all the time. But I do have literally the exact over under for every single line item, on, on, on um, the, which I'm more than happy to show. On the Henrico. Um, uh, it's for the entire budget. So when you're looking for the actual differences and how it all adds up down to the dollar, I have that right here. Well, I, I'm just. Again, I was just wondering what a million dollar drop in revenue was what caught my eye. Yeah, there was, uh, Matt, can you come up? I believe the other one was uh, City of Richmond, debt capacity paid. So I think where that's from is FY 2018, when that was planned, that was the first year before our rate study was done, and I believe we were considering. Uh, 
connection fees inside those revenues versus when FY19 budget was done, it was done after the rate study was complete where we broke those connection fees outside of the operating revenues. So it, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the uh, FY19, that, that was planned according to the rate study when those revenues were only taking into consideration the water service fees, sewer service fees, NRICO true up, and a couple other miscellaneous items. So that's probably why you see that $1 million dropout, because uh, it does not include the, the connection fees we collected last year. Okay. It, it's just a, a change in methodology yeah. between FY18 to FY19, um, it, and as a result of the rate study is why we're doing the, the segmental uh, approach, Mr. Budeski, you just mentioned, as far as using those one-time connection fees to pay for capital expenses versus uh, your service fees paying for operational expenses. Okay, that makes sense. Is that the is that the contributed capital item that I I'm see? pretty sure that ended up being a transfer to the capital to cover those those projects that year. We didn't, you're not even seeing them in here because this is just operations now. So we're not going to have any more contributed cap. I mean, a moment ago you said it sounds like we're going to have some more, but it sounds like we're not going to have any more of those, right? Correct. When, whenever I said, I want to make sure I'm not splitting hairs. What it's this this was what got transferred to the capital back in 2018. When it's the project where I said we're going to put funds aside for the DOC project, that's in the capital fund. So we will be contributing cash to that fund, but it's those funds will go directly from connection fee revenues to that fund, not show up in the operating side. Right. So this fund 57, I think you're looking at fund 57, that's the operating? Yes. Yes, sir. And so that's a transfer in from capital to that, correct? <coughs> that 1067? I, I think it would have ultimately gotten transferred back to, to the capital projects that year. It showed up in that year, and, and this is something Barbara would answer in two seconds for you. <laughs> gotcha. Um, I mean, but it is in this revenue number th that you have on the slide. That, that bottom line number is exactly the number correct. you have on the slide. Correct. And, and in the past, and if you would go back to 17, 16, it would probably look the same way. We, we no longer budget the way we used to, and, and that changed in the current fiscal year. So I think we would have had these contributions in prior that we would That's have right. transferred out eventually right. back to the capital. We don't do it that way any longer. Correct. Um, right. That sounds like it, a it good a thing because it's confusing moving the capital into the operating and then moving it back out. We completely agree. Okay. Uh, and it was done that way for a, a number of years, but it, it also made it a lot more difficult, and the rate study helped with this. It made it a lot more difficult to track what funds were being used for what projects and where. And so now it's much much cleaner to be able to specifically track the revenues through the expenditures. That's right. Yeah, it Thanks. used to be connection fees when they came in would help to offset the operation side, which right. at, on the surface at the very beginning sort of made sense, but in the grand scheme of things, that's not what we want to do. We wanted to take those connection fees and move them specifically for capital improvement projects because that's what they should be for. And that's sort of sort of the industry model. Not everyone does that, um, but that's, that is the big change that you see between FY18 and 19. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. I still have this beautiful spreadsheet if, every, if you ever want to see uh, it. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I know you like Joe. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll like I'll stop by and we'll, we'll That's look right. at the true up of Henrico. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with you. That's the, that true up is with the east end at. Um, it's, it's solely the east end with Henrico. With, and, and, yeah. Yeah, solely with, the, with the East End and Henrico. Has nothing to do with the courthouse area. Okay. However, everyone, everyone is still under the same rate structure umbrella. The court, it doesn't matter if you're in the East End or the courthouse. Everyone's under the same umbrella, but the true up solely on the East End. And, and do you split out to, to see performance? Do you split out the, the two, like you look at the courthouse to see, you know, financial performance? Or it's, it's all, you mm -hmm. say it's truly under one umbrella? And, and it's under one umbrella. Okay. Yeah, it used to be uh, actually right before I started with the county, I think there were seven or eight rate structures. And it was extremely difficult with such a small customer base, having seven different rate structures. I think there was one for lower Tuckahoe neighborhood. There was, it was per neighborhood in some, right. some cases. Gotcha. Um, so right before I was hired, the, um, the board and Ms. Dixon, I believe, went ahead and said, hey, let's pull everyone on the same rate structure because it really is, even though they're 
quote unquote separate systems. They're separated by you know, 10, 15 miles. Um, it's one operation. It's one yeah. Goochland County Department of Public Utilities. There is not a public utilities for the courthouse. It's one public utilities. So different operators are going to the east end, they're going to the courthouse back and forth. So it's really a shared operation. Yeah, gotcha, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Mr. Kildoff, if you don't mind, yes, we're gonna take a quick 10-minute uh, oh, sure. break. Sure. And come back at uh, 4.45. Thank you. Um, okay. We, we, were just through we now continue with our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> okay, the, the third leg of the utilities presentation uh, is dealing with the Tucker Creek Service District the budget, long-term debt, and ad valorem rate outlook. Okay, sorry, I didn't sound like the microphone was on. Uh, so the budget, uh, if you look on the far right side, you see 6.5% increase, which equates to about uh, $400,000 that you see to the left. Um, that increase um, is really a combination of two things, the increase in interest and a small principal interest. The next several slides uh, you've actually seen before, uh, not many changes have been made to these in any way, shape, or form, uh, but we do want to make sure that we present this to you um, as well as to the, the public um, to show them sort of the, um, a little bit of the long-term obligations of the Tucker Creek Service District, sources of revenue, and a few other things. But again, the, some of these slides have been seen in, in various shapes and forms. I'd also like to reiterate that when it comes to the Tucker Creek Service District, we had been receiving calls frequently with just sort of random questions about what the Tucker Creek Service District is. Am I in the district? Am I not in the district? Things like that from our citizens. Uh, so about a year, year and a half ago, we, cre we created an FAQ section of our website that we feel has addressed a lot of the concerns because we haven't had any questions in a very long time. It's not to say that we won't, but if we do and there's a question that we haven't addressed, we'll make sure to update on that on the website. Um, so really, what makes up the Tucker Creek Service District? Uh, it's really three pieces. You have the VRA, revenue bonds, and accreted interest, which was a little under $95 million. We have an agreement with the city of Richmond for the wastewater treatment plant and the upgrades that they do to their wastewater treatment plant, a little under $24 million. And as Mr. Badesky mentioned at a previous portion in the presentation, uh, there was a general, general fund loan back in 2009, and that was about $1.6 million. Sources of revenue for the... TCS, I'm just going to say TCSD moving forward. Uh, there's ad valorem tax. That's the $0.32 cents per $100 of assessed value. There is also 55% revenue sharing from real estate property. Um, and that's all commercial properties and Kinlock subdivision. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The 55% is the increase of the value. Yes. From oh, sorry. Yeah, did I? Yeah, yeah, the 55% of the real estate tax paid on the revenue sharing properties above the base value set. That was in 2014, 2004. Uh, this chart you've also seen before. Um, the blue bars on here, well, actually, this is the previous ad valorem rate outlook uh, per Davenport and Company from September of 2011. Uh, the blue bars was what the expected rates uh, would have been had we not refinanced and refunded. Um, and if you see the purple line that goes across the middle and the call out on the far right, that's the outlook after the 2012 refunding, which has balanced that rate at 32 cents. So where we'd be today is around 60 for F520? Yep, that's, yes, sir. It's around 60 cents, still flatlining at 32 cents. Second. So comparing the ad valorem rate to the assessed values of, of land in the Tucker Creek Service District, that's what this chart is showing. The assessed values are in the orange graph line, um, and that's in billions. And the blue line is the tax rate. Um, and if you notice, around 2012, when it was refinanced, you start to see it flatlining at that 32 cents. So that's comparing the ad valorem rate versus the assessed values in the TCSD. Again, you've seen this slide before, uh, but we do like to continue to show it because it shows 
Um, and a lot, all these slides have excellent information, and all these slides are also, or the imagery is also on the FAQ section of the website. Uh, so slide, this slide um, is showing the TCSD projected revenues uh, versus the debt fund expenses. So in the blue bars you have there, um, that's the ad valorem revenue specifically. That's the $0.32 cents per $100, so that's the blue bar. Uh, the top portion of the blue is the orange. That is the 55% revenue sharing. The gray line that you see going through the orange bars, that is the actual debt service. So what this is telling us is that with the ad valorem being $0.32 cents and with projected annual gross of about 5%, those are assumed 5%, uh, the revenues are actually tracking close to what the debt service is. Uh, let me just clarify. The sure. revenues collectively are exceeding the projected debt service yeah. in all years of this, this particular model. The years that, if you look back at 19 and beyond, where the orange sort of peaks above the gray, those funds, when they've been collected, go into a reserve fund. That reserve fund is pretty healthy right now. And so mm -hmm. one of the questions that w have recently been asked is, we have to grow within the TCSD to be able to continue to meet the debt service. That's right. And the answer is yes and no. Yes, we need to grow at a, at a what a projected 5% growth rate, but we've actually grown even in the past year 10 plus percent in the, in the Tuckwood Creek Service District. So as, let's say we have a year of downturn or the revenues are not meeting that 5%, first thing we do is look at the reserves to make sure that should we tap those reserves to keep that rate steady um, before we would pass on any kind of tax increase to the resident? And the answer usually most likely would be yes there. So I have shared with people that I don't see in the foreseeable future, and I'm lucky, you know, foreseeable for me means two to three years nowadays, not much beyond that. I don't see um, a need to change that rate on the Tucko Creek Service District to meet that debt service obligation. Uh, and so um, I, we are in a very healthy position here. At some point, and the reason this chart only goes to 2028 is because that's the peak year of the debt service on the overall debt obligation. Uh, the debt obligation right now really expires in about 2042 at the current total level. We actually have a reserve that would actually pay the back year plus of obligation on this debt, so it's closer to 2040. Um, at some point, once we got e even more reserves built up, um, while we continue to see healthy growth in the TCSD, we'll be able to ask ourselves the question, do we pay off portions of this debt sooner? Um, do we look at the rate? Uh, we will we'll have options. We just have not recommended to the board to, to look at it quite yet. Um, we, while we are extremely stable, um, we just want to make sure that we get ourselves in a little bit better position. But I don't anticipate in that near term that we're going to have to change this rate. Yeah, and just, uh, just elaborate on that just a bit. If you look very, very closely at the gray line for 2021-22, you see it flattens out just a bit. It, it, it has a pause in the increase each year for the next. So I if in the next couple of years there is the next downturn, um, at least the debt service for the next couple of years uh, levels off just a bit after 2020 for a couple of years, and then it, then it resumes its, its ascent. So we'll have a couple year period in there if, they, if things do fall off, or at least if they don't continue to, to rise, uh, there'll be a pause in the, uh, the debt service increases as well. Did you have a question, Mr. Lumpkin? Well, I was just going to point out that I think that it looks, I was assuming what Mr. Peden said, that the next several years the terms have us at a level debt service. So that makes it, if if this climbs, if, if, if revenue gets, uh, the revenue gets, there's no place that it really gets way above the gray line right here in your projections. But is that what you're thinking in terms of paying it off earlier? Is if that if that if we start to see a, a little bit of a delta between the gray line and the top of the revenue line, that you would you would start to look at, um, at, at paying off sooner? Is that is that the idea? Uh, yeah, we have an opportunity to pay off sooner. You have, you have the ability to look at rate structure to determine if you want to uh, decrease the rate at some point. Um, and so yes, you will have have those flexibilities. I think what Mr. Peterson just said is until we got those increases at the peak to where it flattens back out when you see 26 and beyond, those, those are the kind of things we want to make sure we prepare ourselves for. Yeah, uh, John, on that, um, 
our current run rate, if you will, if you look at this, at FY19 is around a five million or so run rate that we're collecting. That's still not up to the peak levels of debt service requirements in the next several years. So I think until your run rate exceeds your your ultimate, you know, maximum debt service requirements, until you're there, you're not out of the woods yet. So I think we need to continue to stay focused. So it looks like it gets close to six, six and a half million in, in, in about six or so and years. Uh, uh, Does it continue to climb after <coughs> that? <laughs> oh, the debt, the debt service doesn't. But just keep in mind, everything after FY19 here is, are all guesses on the orange line. We just don't know where that's going to go. So sure. if and when the stacked bar exceeds the maximum debt service on a run rate basis, which is, there's no guarantee it'll stay at that same run rate either if, if business activity falls off those. But, but the idea is until your run rate is above, you know, your steady state is above the, the de maximum debt service, you're really not out of the woods yet. So. So the idea is keep an eye on this stack bar, see when it reaches that maximum so that your expected year-over-year -year recurring revenues are above that debt service payment. Until you get to there, you're really not out of the woods yet. So I think uh, what Mr. Badesky is saying is we're cautiously optimistic, but we're not out of the woods yet. So does that make sense? The other, the other reason I like to show this chart is I think there's a little bit of a misnomer that the ad valorem alone pays the TCSD debt. Um, and the debt was structured knowing that it wouldn't completely cover, and that's where that 55% revenue sharing comes in. Um, you know, there's a, the day this debt's paid off, not only will the taxpayers that are paying the current 32 cents see a, a drastic tax reduction, it also means over a million and a half dollars will revert to the general fund to cover service needs or even reduce taxes. And so, it, you know, there will be a point in time where, um, and that assumes no additional investments in the uh, T TCSD infrastructure at that point, and hopefully by then the system will be self-sustaining, so those connection fees and user fees will end up covering that, and we'll actually be able to get, get out of the service district business. Um, but, uh, so we're, you know, right now I'm cautiously optimistic. We've had two years that blew the 5% growth out of the water. Um, in the district. I'm not sure that that's sustainable, but we've had a couple good years. Uh, I think to your point about the related to utilities applies here as well. The more <coughs> customers or um, properties, it kind of levels out the, the burden. So, yeah. So, um, Thank you very much. Uh, so just more of a, just a few more slides on the TCSD portion. Uh, recent year's history, um, some payments that we made from the, excuse me, the TCSD debt fund. Um, in the past several years, if you recall, we had the general loan fund that was mentioned earlier. Uh, we started payments back from that in FY17, and some, some of this money was used to help get that paid off by the year FY22. I think Mr. Badesky mentioned maybe next year. Um, it's FY22. I knew we had it in there somewhere. Another item is payments to Richmond were made from the utilities operating budget in the past. Sort of touched on that, on how Richmond's charges to us, uh, their, monthly, their monthly bill had our debt wrapped in with our monthly usage, and we didn't really like that. So we needed to look at a different way to do that. And we had also known that our payments um, to Richmond were going to start to increase gradually over the 30 years of the agreement that we have with them. Um, so what we decided to do was take another look at that. Um, I guess it was last year because we're currently in, you know, this would be year number two, FY20. Um, what we did was we took what that total dollar value was and simply just divided it by 30 years to see what that at number actually looks like if we were just to make one flat payment every single year um, instead of having one balloon payment. If we were paying less, you have a delta per year, take that delta, move it to the next year, and you have this, you have this unfortunate compounding um, as the years go by all the way up to year 30, you would have this balloon payment. Um, and that's, that's sort of how we were marching to the beat. That's sort of what we were already preparing to do. But we said, hey, let's take a different look at that. Um, and that's why you see this million-dollar jump. That's something that we had not done before uh, and, and until this year. I got FY19 is when we're doing that for the first time. We're going to make a million-dollar payment to Richmond to start paying back that debt that we have with them that you saw on a previous slide. We're recommending doing that again in FY20. So current plan. Uh, maintain the ad valorem rate at 32 cents. 
uh, continue payment to the general fund, $500,000 in FY20 is what we're recommending. Uh, continue the debt payments to the city of Richmond at a million dollars per year. Uh, retain the TCSD fund balance right now, seven millions in the fund, 13 million in US Bank uh, to prepare for our change economy and future refundings. And then the reserve in the general fund uh, of a million dollars. That, uh, that 500K that payback is that, that the capital improvement plan that we have built uh, for the county, that those funds get transferred to that to pay for one time purchases, non, non, not ongoing expenses. So next steps, this is really shoring up the entire public utilities and TCSD presentation. Uh, with these recommendations, uh, public hearing on all tax rates, including TCSD rates and the user rates, uh, to be held April 2nd, and rates and budgets planned for adoption on April 16th. That's the, the next steps, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have um, on the entire presentation thus far. I still have the community development one, which I'll go a little faster on that one for you. <laughs> uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions, and Kathleen's here as well. Matt Longshore, our Director of Public Utilities. Wayne Stevens is our Assistant Director of Public Utilities. And Mr. Badesky is here as well to help answer any questions we have. I'll, I'll start with a quick, quick question. Uh, so the Richmond debt is 23 and a half, little more than 23 and a half million. And did you say what, what year are we in the 30 year deal? Um, uh, off the top of my head, I want to say six or seven. I don't have that in front of me. I do have all that information back, back in my computer. But no, that's um, yeah, that's we're, we're already into it. And, and so I think it started in 2013. What's the interest rate on that? There is no interest. For, from the city of Richmond's debt, yeah, there is that, no, that's, no interest. I, and that, that was in the back of my mind. I remember we talked about this yeah, several months ago. Yeah, great question. So why are we, why are we, why do we want to pay the million? Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so there, there is that question is if we just continue, let's say the lower payments that we had been making ever since, let's say 2013, uh, maybe a year or two earlier, um, you still have, um, let's just call it the delta that you're not paying that compounds the next year. And whatever delta you don't have that year, it compounds the next year. It's a 30-year agreement, so it all has to be paid in year 30 regardless. So you would, if whatever you're not paying this year, you're paying next year, so to speak. So you'd have a big ballooning payment in year number 30, and we wanted to try and avoid that. That's sort of what we were attempting to do for the past several years, and we wanted to avoid that and just do more of a flat line. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, sure go ahead. I don't understand why, if it's, if it's interest-free money, but, but. Yeah, we were actually, I don't even think we were paying them hundred thousand dollars a year it was about seventy thousand um, towards our debt obligation period um, so I, I guess the alternative you're asking is why are we not just putting in the bank earning interest and then pay them in 30 years um, yep um, and so I think the intent of that agreement was that we were going to be making annual contribution they're paying the debt service on what they gave us mm -hmm. and so I, worst case and this isn't a great answer. The spirit of it is, is that we are going to actually meet our portion of the obligation annually with them. I think that was the intent. Mm -hmm. They did write the agreement that it was a 30-year pay or 20-year payback. And, right. And this, came, this is coming back to me. I think we kind of crossed this uh, six months ago or so that we decided. But but I, I don't remember that this size payment being made. I, I know I know there was debate about about interpreting the agreement, and mm -hmm. we wanted to do the quote right thing, but. But if we're doing more than what uh, uh, what we're doing before, I'm, I'm well. Also, I, I think what one item for better or worse is that the city of Richmond's already paid all this. We're sort of paying them back on the debt that they have. So I think as as stewards and that, as um, the relationship that we have with the city of Richmond, I think it's um, a good thing that we would pay them back for something that they've already paid for, um, as opposed to waiting until year 30 and paying it all or something like that. But but then again, that's not what we had been doing. So we hadn't been doing a different philosophy. This is a different philosophy. This one. And remind um, taking me again, did they come to us asking to change the deal? Okay. Yeah. Well, technically, yes. So we haven't changed the fundamentals of the contract. Um, Correct. They certainly came back to us. And quite honestly, if I was them, look, we gave them no indication that we were positioned to meet that obligation That's by right. paying them $70,000 a year on a, on a debt that size. Um, and so we're, we, we ultimately backed into to you know, if we were already seven years in, we wanted to make sure we were positioned to expire that debt within reasonable time frame so we didn't have that ballooning mm -hmm. payment. And so while I think if you look at the pure black and white, we could have wrote them one check at the end of 30 years, um, I think it was our intent to, to, to show a commitment to meeting that obligation. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, Todd, you may know this offhand, you may not. I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but I, I think the way that was originally structured was, you know, they'd front the money, we build out this capacity for our sewage treatment at the city of Richmond, we put in a force main and send them all our waste. And that the payments, I believe initially, were structured somewhat as a uh, as a, a premium payment on the per gallon usage, yeah. you know, to them, and they would get their debt recovery through increasing volumes as the system built out. They'd get a premium above that, and that premium would be a, assigned to the debt payment. What happened was, the first ten or twelve years, it really didn't build out, and so that premium on the small usage really wasn't starting to eat away at that debt the way it was originally envisioned. And so rather than have a total flexibility, it depends on the build out, uh, which is going to be your sorcery payment anyway. So it was nice to structure it that way. But but once it wasn't going according to plan, wasn't building out, and the premiums weren't there, we weren't paying down the debt, the, the deal was starting to not develop the way it was intended, I mm -hmm. guess. So this would get us back onto a schedule of saying, okay, we could have done a fixed schedule at the beginning, in which case we might not have had the, the, the users to pay that fixed schedule. So they did a, a flexible per gallon schedule instead, which is, which is good. But it really wasn't playing out. So we needed right. to, to take a second look at it and say, what's a way to meet our obligations and live up to our original intent of our original agreement? And I think right. that's some of the background on that. Is that ring true? very or? accurate, okay. yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. And that, that, that $1 million, um, Mr. Lumpkins, this past, this, I keep saying this past, this current year and FY20, that's our recommendation. As Mr. Badesky said, it's not anything that's that has been written in stone with the city of Richmond. We're not saying we're paying them a $1 million every year if we need to pay a little bit more one year, a little bit less the next year, so on and so forth, that's something that we're going to pre present every year moving forward. But our, our goal, but we do have the goal, and that's the whole point, is we want to make sure we had a goal we were working towards with a million dollars per year, which is actually higher than if you did the flat line over 30 years. If you did the flat line over 30 years, I think it was like 900000 but with us only paying 70000 you could see where that delta starts to build up and it starts to accumulate I over understand. time. So that's why that million dollars is higher than it would have initially been had we just done that from the very beginning. Right. Um, but again, there was a different philosophy on how we were paying that back in the day. So, um, Well, we need to take the 23 divided by 20, uh, 23 million, uh, 24 million divided by however many years we have left, which sounds like 24 or so. So it's right. close to, or it's close to, that's where you got the close million. Yeah. 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 yeah, and of course, uh, Mr. Lumpkins, there, there, there's always a chance if you put the money in the bank to earn the interest and say, we'll pay it in year 30, there's always a chance you get to year 30 with a balloon payment and somehow that money's not there. So. Any other comments before I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead. In 30 years. <laughs> That's happened before me. Yeah. I'll be speaking during the public comment. <laughs> Bob will be with me. Do I have thumbs up to go to the next? Uh, I think you have thumbs a up. thumbs up. <laughs> Move on. Really Thank you. Close it out. Thank Community you. development. No, no, no. Okay. This one's only three hours, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, you buy our dinner. Oh, okay, there it is. <laughs> I thought they gave us pie. They didn't tell us. <laughs> All right, so community development, economic development, uh, departmental budgets. Uh, this is for community development, administration side, uh, environmental planning, building inspections, and economic development. Uh, so primary functions of community development, uh, it's comprised of these four components, which I already mentioned, uh, planning, zoning, building inspections, environmental, uh, the administration side, as well as the customer service center, which we wrap in there as well. Uh, and staff is responsible for the administration and management of all these components. Here's the budget for the administration side. There's that uh, 0.3 number that I've mentioned earlier, you saw it on the utility slide. You're seeing it on community development, you're going to see it on economic development as well. Uh, but it's really our customer service center manager and myself, that's the staff. Um, so that's why you're seeing a little reduction on the personnel side and operating costs, uh, just a minor reduction there. And there 
is no other significant changes. Future outlooks and challenges, sort of the common theme is, is the growth that we're seeing um, countywide, more specifically on the east end of the county, but countywide we're seeing some growth, so we're trying to balance our staff against that proposed growth, uh, maintain our high level of customer excellence uh, with our increased workload. We still do those customer cards. Um, I think this past year we didn't have anything below a 4.8 on a rating, on an average rating. Um, I think last year was maybe nothing lower than a 4.7 out of 5, so we're pretty proud of that. Uh, replace our outdated permitting software. We'll be working close with the IT department on that. And then the development impact outlook, you can see all the residential lots um, that are approved zoning, have zoning pending, uh, the commercial square footage, um, and we're actually still in, in talks with uh, numerous other developments, more on the economic development side of things. Uh, planning and zoning primary functions provide professional guidance and technical support to the Board of Supervisors, Planning Commission, Design Review Committee, Board of Zoning Appeals, County Administration, General Public, on all things related to planning and zoning in the county. Some of those are listed there, land use, transportation, environmental, um, and administering the county zoning and subdivision ordinance, um, including code enforcement and development. Oversee development and implementation of the comprehensive plan, transportation plans, and small area studies and carry out demographic analysis for historical resource protection, regional planning, regional transportation planning, and rural planning. Process development applications, uh, including rezoning, CUPs, subdivisions, uh, certificate approvals, variances, just reading down through here, uh, and review plans of development. We also call them PODs, building and sign permits, and business licenses. So the budget, um, personnel costs, as, as um, Kathleen has mentioned, sort of the common thread was increases in um, salaries and benefits and things like that. Operationally, there's just a minor increase there, and that was due to printing and binding um, and dues and membership. So not a major increase on operations. As you can see from the staffing perspective, there are no recommendations uh, for, for more staff on the planning side. Uh, one of our projects that we're excited to get going this year, uh, this was funded last year for this year, and it actually wraps into FY20 as well, is digitizing all of our zoning maps. Uh, this is actually very important to us because when we digitize these maps, um, it's not just uh, putting the map into GIS. It's actually going to be a very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, interactive experience for anyone at their house. They can click on these maps. They can see what conditional use permits uh, a, a parcel of land may have or any COAs or anything that a parcel of land may have. So it's not just putting um, some imagery on a map. It's actually going to have some metadata behind it that somebody can click on and get a little bit more information. Uh, the next several signs are for transportation projects. You're familiar with all these, so I'll go through them pretty quick. But the Fairground Road Extension and Intersection Improvements, the, that's a two projects. Uh, the intersection at Fairground and Sandy Hook is a roundabout project. The first, second bullet point you see there, it's 40% drawings are in. 40% from BDOT's perspective means public hearing drawings. That's what they call them. It is not the type of public hearing that we have here in, the, in this building. Their public hearings are really just setting up tables around a room. They have an environmental section, a right-of-way section, a planning section, and it's really sort of a free-range operation for the public. Anybody can come in, ask any questions they want. They can come in when they want and leave when they want. They just leave it open for, for basically a two-hour period. Um, we're actually in the process of scheduling that pub public hearing sometime this April. We're still trying to hone in on dates with them. And the extension, just refresh your memory, is 50-50. Revenue share, total 3.9 million. And engineering is underway for both of those projects. Um, happy to report that next year this image is going to go away that you see there. That's the old image we've always been using. We're going to have something much better next year in the presentation, and maybe even more specifically during the annual report. Uh, we had the major thoroughfare plan approved this year, which we're very excited about. That gives us a better plan moving forward. Transportation planning organization, if you're not familiar with that, and for our citizens okay. to hear the... Um, it's called the RRPDC, the Richmond Regional Planning District Commission. They have a division called TPO, Transportation Planning Organization. Uh, being a part of that actually helps us when it comes to trying to obtain funding from VDOT. And there's several other reasons why, but um, obtaining VDOT funding for projects and having TPO support is actually big for us. It did, we were not, even though Goochin County is a part of it, not all the county is. It was only really more 
east, like Crozier to, towards the east. We really wanted the courthouse to be involved in the TPO as well. So we petitioned them. Long story short, they ended up adding the court, expanding their boundary to Encore Courthouse. That is interestingly not the first time they've expanded their boundary. I think they've done it probably 12 different times over the years. So. We're happy that they did that. And we also received $200,000 in transportation alternative funding for the East End Trail project. We made four smart scale applications, three chop road underpass, the I-64 Ashton Road interchange, which would be a divergent diamond, just like at Zion's Crossroads. Oilville interchange, which we, we have known issues there, and the Route 288 stars. Um, that's strategic, strategically targeted affordable roadway solutions. That's VDOT saying, hey, we, we have two lanes going north and two lanes going south on 288, but we also have shoulders. Let's utilize our shoulders during the AM and peak at PM hours. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair Todd, can you go back to the three chopped underpass again? Yes, sir. Right. Has there been any discussion about part of that road becoming private for anything, for any reason? Have you heard anything in that regard? Uh, no. You mean the actual underpass portion or some of the adjacent <coughs> no, roads? The, the, uh, the road w east of it? Right over here, um, the uh, Four Rings, you mean? Yeah. Four Rings Drive. There has been no talk. Debbie, can you confirm that? No talk of that road being private? Oh, oh, running parallel to 288? Are you talking three chop running parallel to 288? I got it highlighted on the screen up there. Are you talking this road here? That's three chopped, and then this one over here is four rings drive, which is on the east side of the Audi dealer. Right, okay. Yeah, I don't think any of those, correct me if I'm wrong, are private. Just that, just that. Okay, okay. It's just a little portion, it's the little portion of three chop right there. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like there's something pending that we're going to get. So um, when we when it comes in, we're happy to share that with you, whatever that is. We also attended. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Am I am I going to? Let me know if I'm going too fast. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, Todd, um, the 288 stars. Where does that stand? I mean, you described it as. Uh, peak hours going each direction, borrowing the shoulder for an extra lane. Where, where does that stand at this point? Uh, um, well, the smart scale application has been made. Um, they're, technically, the results are back. However, I'm reluctant to say anything about those results because there's been a lot of contention on them. Um, there's a lot of localities that are currently in talks and it could change, so I'd hate to say anything about it. Um, but the re they, did ha they did actually submit results. Some of the, I, I can say this, uh, some of the projects, I think only 14 projects were awarded in the entire region. Um, we were close to the list, close to the top with one of our projects, Oilville, uh, but it just wasn't in that 14. And some of the contention is what projects were awarded. If you look at the list, uh, a lot of it was sidewalks, trails, things like that, when we have legitimate road issues, legitimate road concerns and safety concerns. And that wasn't just us. That was all the other localities came together and said, hey, wait a second. Um, we really thought that this money would be for something else, for, for roads specifically, road intersection improvements, traffic signals, things like that. Um, and to see, you know, four or five projects on there that was more hardscape, things like that. It, it, uh, some people were a little upset by that. So it's still in the works. So I'm reluctant to say anything, anything more than that because hopefully some things can change as more conversations and dialogue are had with those smart scale applications. I was, did I answer your question? Um, yeah, kind of. Just yeah, you can't say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can if you want. No, 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 I can't tell you. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm more than happy to. I just. Uh, well, no, I understand, Tom. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, as I look at that smaller, well, the map to the right of the 288 star. I mean, it's a. It goes from Cap One all the way down across the bridge over to Palatine. It's a large project, and that is one of our primary congested areas, particularly during peak hours, and something's got to be done there, and that's why I asked where that stands, because uh, uh, to say that nothing's going to get done here is, is uh, that would be that would be something that would be uh, a disservice, I think, to everybody uh, in, in the county, uh, but of course, VDOT has the control over that. So if you wouldn't mind just keeping us up to speed to the extent you're able to tell us anything without having to kill us, uh, that'd be great. I appreciate it. <laughs> 
I can show the microphone off and whisper. Uh, but really what <laughs> yeah, it is, it's whisper, two apps. It's not really telling me. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, um, it's actually two applications, by the way. Um, okay. The one from Huguenot Trail and Powhatan all the way up to Tucker Creek Parkway. That was actually a, a, another smart scale application that the TPO did. So we thought that was more of a heavy hitter. That's, a, that's everyone coming together and saying that this project is something that's important to the region. Um, and that was still below, just a little bit below on the list. So um, our application was for Tucker Creek Parkway to Broad Street. Because when they did their study, they, they said, well, their study was specifically was for Huguenot Trail to Tucker Creek Parkway. The study said, hey, there's still issues farther north. And so they approached us and said, hey, county, Goochum County, here's the data for that. If you would ma want to make this another smart scale application, that's up to you. You're more than welcome to use our data for that. And we said, well, that's great because we are allowed as a county to have four applications. And at the time, we only had three. So that gave us our fourth application. So overall, it was a good thing. Uh, but they're still in the works on, still in the works on, um, what the results actually mean. I know there's there's been a lot of talk at the CTV level and all the, even at the TPO, at their level as well. And yeah, we, uh, and we can uh, tell them we want to put a sidewalk on 288. <laughs> <laughs> if you call it a sidewalk. And, and then expand 288 while the, while the sidewalk uh, is in. <laughs> a bike lane. <laughs> uh, there were um, uh, at least a couple of projects that didn't have the priority of the TPO that were inserted and no Cushland project made the funded list. Uh, and there was one Powhatan project that fell right below right. Yeah. Uh, the, the funding list. Right. And there's obviously a lot, a lot of issues with the, the process. Yeah. I, I think it was a good idea in the beginning, but then um, there have been other things that influenced the ranking of the projects beside the priorities of uh, traffic congestion, Safety. Accidents, safety, um, funding available. So there are a few other things, and it was at least one project that even some folks in the city had concerns with, because the the project it supports hasn't even been approved. So uh, <laughs> I, I can tell you more. That's six million. That that one's six million there. The so one that was that, a that was yeah, a big one. Big project that's that made that made the list with room to spare. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it ended up being funded at number two or number three, even though it wasn't in the priority for the TPO. Uh, the, the power of the voters. So, so, so may I ask a question? So in your discussions, the, the Powhatan project that didn't just was the first one that didn't make the cut. Mm -hmm. The supervisor from Powhatan asked the VDOT representative, and I'm talking about, the, and by the way, this is the RRTPO meeting. Mm -hmm. and. I've gone to a few of these, and I know the meeting you go to is probably where the work gets done. The, the, and so maybe you'll have more insight mm -hmm. than, than we did. But I thought it was an interesting question that the Powhatan supervisor asked. Um, if we, if I go back to my board of supervisors and offer to contribute some money to the project, will that help it? Mm -hmm. Because obviously one of the it things does. is cost mm -hmm. of the project. So I would. If you notice, if you saw the list, I'm sorry not to interrupt, but if you saw the list, you, you would see that a lot of localities made contributions, which increases your score. But John, the, the problem with that was that the list has already been prioritized. So they're saying you're not going to move up on the list. So the, if you have money to put towards a project, you've got to have it as part of your application and say, hey, we're going to cover 50% of the project. And then they take the other 50% and say, what value are we getting for this amount that VDOT is investing? or the CTV is investing. Mm -hmm. And and so that makes it more palatable. It improves the ROI for the, the Commonwealth Transposition Board um, to do that. Mm -hmm. But after the fact, they say, well, we've already ranked them. Yeah, and, uh, and I get that, you know, you would just get into it. Because I think I think New Kent is the last one on the list that made it. And of course, when he says, right. we'll put some money in the New Kent says, well, no, you're not. I'm, we're going to. So you get into a little bidding war to get right. the last few. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's not a way to, well. Not that the way we're doing it is a way to build roads, but that's certainly not the way to build roads, is, yeah. is to get into a, a post-award competition. Right. But, but ex how is it going to change? Is it, is it going to be just, you, you say it's not over. I mean, is, are they going to Well, be, uh, we, haven't, we haven't heard that it's a done deal. I think the CTB still needs to vote on it, because just because so, the scores are in okay, doesn't so mean it's done. The CTB. So what we saw, the list, it had, it had the district rank, and, and so, and I think it, it was awarded by district rank, it looked like to me. Yeah. So you're saying that this, that's just only, there's still another step for, for the final award. Correct. This, 
This is correct. And, and what I wasn't going to say, I think we've already said, um, I was trying to avoid saying that none of these projects had been awarded because we were still in talks. But that is, that is where we are. Um, none of them were awarded, none of the four. The closest one was Oilville. I don't remember which number it was. Maybe Mr. Albers, you might remember. Uh, top. Um, the I think there was 14 was the funded. First, we were page, 20, 25. Does that mean yeah. anything? But, but again, I think there was just, um, there were some people, there were some localities that were upset by what actually did get funded. Everyone just assumed that smart scale was gonna be uh, widening roads, uh, better intersections, things like that, that counties actually needed and it ended up being trails and sidewalks and things like that. So um, I think that's where, I think when the CTB meets the vote on that, that's what they're gonna hear. And I, the, I don't know what's gonna come out of that. And so. I wasn't trying to get you to say something you didn't sure. wanna talk about. But the I, C, I did, I'm but good. The C, <laughs> but the CTB, the way this process works, what we saw was not a final, Regardless, I mean, maybe in the past that's been a final decision, but there's still another step in the process. That's right. After. Yeah, only the scores are in, and that's just from the BDOT level. It still has to be. And those voted scores on. come in and they dictate that district ranking. Uh, well, there's a, there's a state I apologize. Ranking. I don't recall the district ranking aspect to it, but um, it's probably right. I, I haven't looked at the list since, it, since it came in. There was a state ranking and a district rank. And okay. It looked like. It I know there's like a few different on there, but. Anyway. Um, how it was actually categorized. I can't remember off the top of my head, but. I think the state rank is kind of the key. That's where we've fallen into the funding bucket for the state. We as a district might be able to move some things around if we don't think a project is the right project. Uh, um, I just think it'll, it'll be hard to do. Um, yeah. But. And if one of these projects has a priority and ends up not getting funded and we and we as a county want it. There are the other funding mechanisms, but smart scale would be the one where that's the cream of the crop. That's where they could potentially fully fund a project. There's always revenue share applications where we'd have to come up with half the money, so on and so forth. There's other funding sources out there, but smart scale was sort of the one we were hanging our hat on for at least one or two of these projects. But okay. it's, un it's unfortunate, but we'll, we'll see what comes out of the CTB meeting and the future meetings. Oh, let me go backwards. Uh, speaking of the CTB, um, we attended two Commonwealth, um, I didn't know if I said CTB stands for Commonwealth Transportation Board, I apologize, I don't know if I said that earlier. Uh, but I attended two of those meetings, and out of the first one I went to, well, I've been to several over the past few years, but the last two, we mentioned about our traffic signals and trying to make sure um, that we can get those expedited. So they were, uh, I'm happy to report that the ones on West Creek Parkway and Patterson Avenue were expedited and, and complete, and the exit ramp for Route 288 and Broad Street um, those were supposed to be a four-year cycle. They shaved off about a year and a half already. And last I heard, they were potentially going to shave off another nine months due to the, the low amount of right-of-way that they'd have to require um, purchasing. They thought there was going to be a lot. It turns out there might just be a little, which could push that forward even faster. So we'll keep you posted on that as it moves forward. Outlooks and challenges, uh, zoning and subdivision ordinance rewrite, which you're familiar with at the last meeting. Um, that's still moving forward. Increases in development activity. Uh, management of the transportation projects and digitizing the zoning maps. Moving forward to the environmental and land development, their primary functions are provide engineering expertise to all county departments, agencies, and citizens in all matters related uh, to site development and the environment. Uh, they process and review all of our PODs, plan of de developments, land disturbance permits, we call them LDPs, and all of our stormwater permits. They assist staff and citizens with all environmental concerns, and they oversee all site construction aspects with, re with regard to erosion sediment control and plan of development inspections. So the budget. Uh, again, slight increase on personnel. Um, due to uh, salary increase, one salary increase, um, the percent increase from last year or this year recommended, and um, the benefits, operational costs, minor increase. Now, while that item in particular, I wanna talk about that just for a second. While it's only $5,200, it appears that it's just that increase. Um, it is, but it's actually a $30,000 increase in contracted hauling, which moved to another department, and a 44,000, oh, there's a few other things associated with it, but on, on the high level, the big dollars, uh, $44,000 increase uh, when we moved Monacan Water and Soil Conservation District to the Environmental Department. That, so if you look at previous years on that line item in the budget book, you'll see zero, 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 and then all of a sudden 44,000. That was a transition to moving Monacan into the environmental budget. 
that, that, that used to show up as a contribution mm -hmm. as we, we've shared with you that we moved them into the departments this year. Okay. If there are no staff requests, so no significant changes, future outlooks, combination of dealing with the state regulations. Um, they, we sometimes feel like they're ever changing and we try to stay on top of them as best we can. Implementation of the Chesapeake Bay TMDLs, uh, that's gonna challenge us to develop uh, innovative ways when we work with our uh, developers and site contractors and, and engineering firms. And also implementation of our best management practice monitoring portion of our stormwater program. Uh, again, common thread with all these is dealing with all the, the growth that we're seeing in the county. Uh, the up updating our um, the zoning ordinance rewrites that impacts all departments definitely, um, also, but specifically the environmental department. So updating the zoning subdivision and POD codes to address issues with development, subdivision and parking standards, and development and adoption of updated floodplain maps. Our staff has been working diligently, and as a matter of fact, with with, with um, the state agencies and FEMA. And they went to a meeting, I believe it was a conference, Debbie? Was it a conference or a seminar just recently on FEMA uh, for some of those updates? So we'll have more of that. And we'll present to you as, as we get some more information on that. Um, that's actually in the works. Um, that's sort of it for the environmental section. But since Monacan has moved in to that portion of the budget, uh, we do want to talk a little bit about Monacan. They did re request a minor increase. I believe it was just a few thousand dollars. And they gave us a little quick breakdown on what that is. And actually, Keith Burgess is the, the director over there. And he's here in the back. And he can answer any questions if you have any. Um, he's a district manager. But really, it's a request of six additional hours of work per week for him and half a day of work additional for the administrative assistant, which actually deals with these additional duties that I have listed below. There is also a previous state funding source that's no longer being funded. Um, so that has impacted their, their budget. They're also looking to do a five-year schedule for computer replacement, computer hardware replacement, and a vehicle replacement program. And again, Keith is here if you have any questions on that. Uh, building inspections. Their primary function is to preserve and promote the health, safety, and welfare of the public through the regulation of the built in building environment in accordance with a uniform statewide building code. There is an increase uh, on the personnel side, and that's due to our third and final staffing request. Um, that would be for, I want to make sure I get the title right, a residential plan reviewer. <laughs> I want to make sure I get that, the, the actual title right there. A residential plan reviewer, um, we're seeing Actually, for that, that particular position, um, there has been, since there's been so much residential growth, our commercial side of the house has actually had to supplement the residential side. And they had been doing a good job. They've been doing it for a few years. But unfortunately, it's just at the point now where they're at their breaking point. And they actually need somebody specifically on the residential side because they have very specific deadlines. I think two-day turnarounds, if I remember correctly, on certain permits that they have to talk about and issue and inspections. Um, and we want to make sure that that's all met. And right now, the growing pains are just at the point where they definitely need that other person. And on the operating cost side, just a minor increase. And just keep in mind that some of the projects we're going to need to support, the hospital has at least two, two years straight of uh, additional responsibilities on our department that we're going to need to support. Th this is one of those revenue supported positions that that hospital paid substantial fees uh, to be able to ha make sure that we're there to be able to respond and assist with that project being timely. So we, we think this is something that, that we... It, we're always cautious to recommend positions that we don't think that we can sustain. I think we're getting to the point now where this will round out what we think will be a sustained workload. So future outlooks and challenges for the inspection department. Um, new permitting software, that's going to be huge for us. Right now our current software does not provide any type of citizen portal. Um, that's something that we do want. We do a lot of our calls that we get on a daily basis. I believe we have... Um, 3,000 calls just this past month, something like that. Um, it's a significant number, but a lot of those calls are just a contractor saying, where's my permit? What's the status of my permit? When's my inspection? And all that's done over the phone. We're looking for an online portal. A lot of other counties have it, and we, we firmly believe that with this new permitting software, those calls will drop off significantly, which will free up staff to do other work. Development of a grease interceptor annual inspection program. Uh, it's an important program. We'll update you more on, on that as it moves along. And again, balancing staff against increased growth 
and completion and publication of depart departmental policies. Sort of brought this for visual effect, but we just wanted you to see um, it's sort of the win the lottery mentality. If anybody wins the lottery, can anybody else sit at that person's desk and do everything that they're supposed to do on a daily basis without having any training on it? Um, so in this book, we actually have, we've been working on it for the past few years, a printing out. It's not just a step-by-step, -step, it's a step with an image. Another step two with an image, step three with an image. So anybody can point and click in the computer and know exactly where they need to go to, uh, to start a permit, an electrical permit, a plumbing permit, something like that. Um, anybody can sit down and do that. So we're very proud of that. It's about 90% complete. It's almost done, and when it's done, we're going to be very happy with that. We actually have a new staff person in the customer service center right now who's already been using this, and so it's been effective. Uh, last department Mr. I have here. Excuse me. Oh, oh, sorry. Could you back up one slide, please? Oh. Um, yes. First bullet, uh, new permitting software, um, provide web inter interface for the public. Yes. Uh, will uh, an applicant, if this is installed and acquired and up and running, will an applicant be able to go to a website and check the status of their permit, see whose inbox it's sitting in and why it's not moving, that kind of thing? <laughs> um, um, it, it, I think some of these permitting softwares, you can kind of drill down as much as you want. But the ultimate thing is when somebody calls and says, where's my permit? It's not necessarily where it lives. It's where's my permit? And we can say it's due to be issued at 5 o'clock today, or you can pick it up first thing in the morning, something like that. It'll say the status ready, and then they don't even have to call. They could just come in. They looked on the online portal, saw that it was ready. They came and pick it up, and they're back on their job site. They can do that now, or that's the plan? They cannot do that now. But that's why we want this new software. That's where we're going, software. too. Okay, so that would reduce your call volume. People could check themselves, and, not, and then when it's ready, they can just come in and pick it up. That's right. Okay. Um, you know, and I say pick Good. it up, but, you know, there's also the potential option. Again, some of these programs are so fancy that you can drill down. They might be able to even print off their own permit. So that's something else that we're looking into as well. And, we're again, we're working real close with the and IT department Use technology to make it faster and easier. And oh, yes. So then we're not using our own paper for printing and Xeroxes and all that. So, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Uh, economic development. This is a new department, not new to the county by any means, but new to the community development side of the house. Uh, we're happy to provide uh, the insight into the primary functions on economic development. Other uh, primary functions are to uh, attract new businesses to Goochon County retain existing businesses, assist all businesses with their efforts to grow and expand, and stimulate investment to build the county's tax base by recruiting new businesses and capital investments. Manage the county's economic strategic plan. Uh, we're happy that we have one. It's from 2011. We're in the process of updating it now, and we've made significant strides um, with that updated plan. So we're really happy that that's moving forward. and. Now that we're fully staffed, we have Sarah Worley, one of our economic development coordinators, and Casey Verberg was hired uh, at the beginning of January. Those two have been doing a great job working together and getting these plans moving forward and making connections uh, with our community. Uh, another facet that not many people focus on too much with economic development is the workforce side. I go to the Capital Region Workforce Development Board meetings, uh, and you can see here it's workforce. It's really just connecting the right people to the right jobs. Can people in Goochin County stay in Goochin County and work in Goochin County, especially if they graduate from high school this year? Or apparently you can graduate from high school now with a college degree. You couldn't when I was in high school. Um, but when they graduate, do we have jobs here in Goochin for those individuals? So those are things we're working on, uh, not just internally, but with the schools. So that's uh, with the personnel changes that I just mentioned. That's why you're seeing the personnel uh, adjustments there. The, the increase, again, one third of my salary goes there. Uh, operating costs. Uh, that the, the increase that you're seeing there is really just on the marketing and promotion side of things, if you look at the line I'm in the budget. Uh, we're making more strategic advances in uh, what we're doing and how we're marketing the county. Uh, we're really sort of in the infant stages on that front, uh, and we'll keep you posted as that moves forward. We're happy to report that we've expanded a lot of our relationships. If you recall when Matt Ryan was here, he was just one person, so one person can only do so much. Now we have three people, well, 2.3 people. Uh, we've got, started going to every single chamber of commerce meeting that they have. They used to meet monthly, now it's bi-monthly. Uh, we went to their silent auction. We gave a presentation at the VEDP. We were, actually, let me skip to the next slide. <clears throat> we gave two presentations. One was at the Land Development Design Initiative, basically telling a bunch of people that may not have known much about Goochin County what, who Goochin County is and why we're important and why we're a really good county to, to be in, to live in, to work in, and to play in. Uh, 
The interesting one was when we went to the VEDP. We weren't too sure exactly how that was going to go. We thought it was just going to be me and Sarah Worley in a room of, with three people. It was actually a very long table. Probably 70 people were in there. We showed them our bond rating video, and we just showed a bunch of people that thought Goochland was 80 miles away past Charlottesville. That That's not where we're at. And so when we were done, there was lots of people, their jaws were on the table that came up and were asking us all kinds of questions. So having that relationship continue to build is very important to us. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and we have a little over a billion dollars in construction activity, which I think you've seen on in previous presentations. So our outlooks and challenges, completing our strategic plan, benchmarking our economic development department and economic development authority structures with other localities. It's important just to see where we stand, see what other people are doing, what are they doing to be successful, so on and so forth. Our business retention and expansion. We want to go to our existing businesses. We want to find out where they're at, talk to them. Why do they like being in Goochland? Do they have any issues with being in Goochland? Maybe their road has issues and we can help help them with their road situation, maybe call VDA and just start to start to build up the relationships we have with our existing businesses and build relationships with commercial brokers and such. So I kind of flew through that pretty quick, um, but I'm happy to field any questions, and we do have our community development and economic development staff here to answer any questions you may have. Talk before, if you don't mind, yes. uh, strategic plan, uh, this board, Mr. Lopez, I think it was right before you guys, we had a, uh, were you involved in the joint retreat? Uh, it, was, it was right around that time frame. At the, at the hospital, at the yes. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. Um, the work product out of that, we are about next month, we'll be going over a draft version of a build-out plan with the EDA. We, at the April 2 by 2s plan to go over that plan with the full board. Uh, and then we'll discuss at that point how we want to try to adopt and move forward with that plan. But they, there's been a lot of work since that meeting to sort of build that out, plus learn, you know, spend more time with others in the region. Uh, and so you're going to see that in much more detail. Um, some of the initiatives... Uh, you saw uh, part of the operational increase in Todd's request um, ultimately is to have some more marketing funds to be able to target it to specific initiatives that we've identified in that strategic plan for the next fiscal year. Um, target marketing uh, of particular market sectors, um, focusing on raising awareness of certain um, sectors of our community that we've, we're promoting for business development. Things that we haven't been as intentional about historically um, are now going to be tied specifically to outcomes in that defined plan. So you'll see a little more of that in, in the months to come here. You have a question for yeah. Ms. Um, I don't have a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kildoff. I just wanted to thank you for one little small thing right. that's a pet peeve of mine is that you made all the photocopies in black and white. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, I, for telling I me to print everything in black and white. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought I had gone I color blind. Yeah, I wouldn't come, feel right taking the floor. Congratulations. How come mine's in black and white? <laughs> Mr. Peterson? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Todd, if you wouldn't mind humoring me for just a second, did you still have that presentation up or did it disappear? Um, the presentation? No, time's up, Mr. Peterson. Uh, it's timed out. You know what? I got my maybe, slides we can, if you have maybe we can do slide. it without it. Um, it was on slide 26. Okay. That's okay. Maybe we can handle it without the slides. Sure. Um, I was just taking the audience Monica, the Monica and the folks Monica Soil? Home. Yeah, Monica and Soil and Water. Um, yep. The first bullet point said minor increase in support, but there, there wasn't any numbers to go with this uh, in terms uh, of the budget. Uh, I think it was 2,000, um, if 2, I remember correctly. Um, Debbie, I think it was 42 to 44. 44, okay. Yeah, I so think it was 42 to 44, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think it was about $2,000. So, that, okay, that's the minor, because yeah. it didn't have the numbers to go with it. I just, yeah. I mean, there are yeah. citizens uh, that are concerned with the Monacan Soil and Water mm -hmm. funding, and I just wanted to the, make sure that the, the citizens that were concerned about the Monacan Soil and Water funding knew that there was an increase in the budget. So. <laughs> Yeah, the one. Yeah. Yes, there's. So if you look in there, it's not going to show this, last year's, though, unfortunately. This doesn't increase. It's a lot of time for speaking, right? No. Well, okay. I think it's it, it, for every increase, there's less time allotted at the microphone for <laughs> speakers to uh, something like inverse okay. report. Uh, anyway, no, I just didn't know what the number was because it said minor. I just wanted to know what. So yeah. 42 to 44. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's 42 great. to 44. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good question. Thank you. 42 to Any 44. other questions for Todd? <laughs> yeah. One quick one. One quick one. Oh. How sure. do you have 2.3 full-time positions? Uh, the point three is one-third 
Oh, you told me that. That's right. Yeah. That was a one, one so slide, and I just stumped. And I got yeah, you see the point three in three different compartments. You, That's you did me. say much earlier that yeah. how you divided that up. There so is one-tenth of him that apparently is not working. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's his day off. That's Sunday. <laughs> that's his Sunday off. I'm going to go home and cry. <laughs> Put a bar over top of it. <laughs> All right. 2.3 bar. Anything else for Todd? Okay. Th thank, thank you, Todd. Thank you very much for and your time. Thank you, Kathleen, for your work today and everybody that helped uh, provide input to these presentations. I think that concludes our program. Mr. Chairman, we, we, oh, we don't necessarily put it on as an agenda item, but always at the end of the presentations, try to regroup if there's any outstanding questions right. from the last session, today's session. Uh, that we want to answer here. Certainly, some of you have already reached out to me outside of this setting and continue to encourage you to do that. Yeah. But if there's anything broadly outstanding to date, um, we're, we're glad to try to answer those questions or, or uh, take them back and get you a response later. But again, that, that's a standing invitation. Great. Well, I'm, I'm just going to say something with a point of executive privilege here, if I could just take two minutes. Um, what we saw today is uh, fairly dramatic increases in the um, investment in Goodson County. The private sector is investing literally hundreds of millions of dollars in this county and betting that this is a good place to do business. Uh, you can't make them do that. Um, you can only set the table and hope that they do that. And the fact that they're doing it today is, is not a coincidence. It, it, it's the cumulative effect of all the good actions that this team, including everyone on staff, everyone up here, all the actions that we've done over the last several years are now being reflected in the prosperity that this county is enjoying. The tide is coming in. We are seeing an increase in activity. The downside is that staff is running 100 miles an hour going flat out, but that's great. Um, just know that this will not last forever. They never do. Uh, the last downturn, we prepared for the next upturn by cutting the time it takes to get a rezoning through by adding some inspectors so that we don't have bottlenecks. Uh, we should use these good times to prepare for the next downturn as well. Um, then it won't be catch us flat-footed and by surprise, and we won't have to react. So, again, I want to thank everybody, but your good work over the last couple of years is reflected in these good numbers that we're seeing today. Um, it's kind of proof positive that what you're doing is, is doing the right things for the right reasons. So that's all I had, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? If not, if there's nothing else to come before the board, uh, we will adjourn to uh, Tuesday, March 5th at 3 p.m. for a regular business meeting. And uh, school budget is going to be presenting their um, proposed budget at that time. And then the public hearings at 7 p.m. And then on March 12th, we have the um, joint session with the school board. And that will be at 3 p.m. Uh, in room 270. Uh, after that, we'll have our um, budget hearings on April 2nd at 3 p.m. and regular public hearings at 7 p.m. and then on April 16th we'll meet again to adopt the budget. So Just the, the budget public hearings will be at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. yes the hearings will be at 7 p.m. on April 2nd. So with that if there's nothing else we will adjourn to March 5th. Thank you. <laughs>